Hello everyone. I hope you have a very good day. My name is Umar Harun Malik. I'm head of market operations and development at CBPA. I'm also a board member of Association of Power Exchanges, which is Apex. Well, it's been 27 years since Apex was formed, and one of the main goal of Apex was to uh, provide platform to share information between its 48 member countries. We have been very successfully doing that by holding our signature annual conferences. Also, you know, we have recently launched the electricity market training program, which is also contributing toward this, uh, attaining this goal. Well, uh, EMTP, which is electricity market training program, uh, has been organized into eight sessions. We have completed six, uh, five sessions to date, and today we are here. Uh, we will cover, in this session, we will co cover four different electricity markets, starting from India, US PGM, uh, then we'll go towards uh, uh, Spain and then Brazil. Well, this slide shows the EMTP on globe. We have uh, registered over 214 participants. Uh, the average number of participants, as you can see on your screen, have been in five sessions was 180. Uh, we have done 22 hours of training. And as you know, we have completed five sessions. So about 13, uh, we have participants from 13 countries and uh, you can see that on your screen. Well, for today, I'll take not more than 10 to 15 minutes to give you a perspective on electricity market, uh, uh, comparative markets. And then we will move towards, uh, the first presentation will be given by Mr. Dhruv from uh, Indian Power Exchange, which is the leading power exchange in India. Then we will move towards Mr. Tim, who is a senior director at PGM, which is one of the largest uh, wholesale markets in the world. Then uh, third presentation will be given by Mr. George Jorge Bercher. Uh, and finally, Mr. Ricardo will give uh, the presentation on Brazilian market. Mr. Bercher uh, is a leading consultant, rather a partner at MRC Consultant. And uh, Mr. Ricardo is, uh, is, uh, is a partner at PSR. Both of them are very uh, you know, leading consultancy names in the world of uh, comparative market development. So participants, here is the agenda for today. We will start from Indian electricity market, followed by PGM. Then there will be a session, a break, and a quiz. So you will serve with a quiz. Uh, so this break is for 15 minutes, and we, we anticipate that you will be able to do the quiz in five to seven minutes. Uh, after that, we'll move on to Spain and then Brazil. And at the end, uh, you all are encouraged to please uh, post your questions uh, during the session on, on the team's, uh, team's bar. You know, there you can post your questions. We'll collect them, and you know you can those questions will be answered by uh, the presenters at the very end of the session. So we the whole session uh, should end in less than three hours. Uh, and we hope that you will have a very kind of memorable and enjoyable uh, next two to three hours. There's one important note uh, is about uh, your signing in of Google Classroom. So you can see the link. You have it already in your emails. Uh, it is also posted in Microsoft Teams chat box. So you can click that and please do sign in because your quiz can be done in the Google Classroom only. So dear participants, I'll keep my uh, lecture very short. So this uh, is intended to set the perspective uh, and the background for the four presented to come. So you can see on your screen that here are the three markets that uh, took their start towards their comparative market journey in late 1990s. Um, and India was also not that late to start. They started off introducing the comparative market in 2007 and 8. So one, one important thing was that all of these uh, four market designs are different. You will see uh, when the presenter will present to you because they had their their goals, but their path was different to achieve those goals. So you know you will see that when the presenters will make the presentation. So as we all know that uh, there are four market structures. So when when we are you, you have everything under the sun under one entity, and then you debundle the sector. You have a single buyer, a separate entity. Uh, so this debunding happens, and the first real transition towards com competition is typically is, is towards a wholesale market in which you have large customers who have choice, and they can choose their supplier of their own choice, and then you move gradually towards the retail competition. Well, the speed is more robust and fast in developing de developed countries and is slow in developing countries. Well, on this map, you can see that uh, as of today, you see much of the blues and the greens, right, in the, in the Americas and the South Americas uh, and uh, the Western part of the world. And then you, you can also see that in, uh, today the VIUs do exist here in parts of Africa, 
and other parts of the world as well. Well, the point I want to make on this slide is that every market design is unique. Uh, although the goals are quite similar, but each of the each of the countries uh, have taken their own path uh, towards achieving their goals in terms of their market design. Uh, the market design vary due to uh, several design parameters that will just skim through the next two slides. However, we can categorize uh, different markets uh, across the globe in two main categories based on the model of the generation dispatch. Either the, gener the generators in that very market are subject to centralized security constraint economic dispatch, or they are self-nominated or self-dispatched. So European model is kind of uh, a net put model in which we see a self-dispatch on unit nomination model. And uh, the rest of the world is including the North Americas, Pakistan, Philippines, et cetera, we see South America, we see a security constraint economic dispatch model. So these are two broad categories in which, which we can distinguish. Uh, however, within these two categories, each of the market model of different countries, they vary. And that varies because of uh, because of the design parameters that uh, I'll show you in the next slide. We have discussed those in the first few modules. So here, here we have listed a few parameters based on which uh, you know the countries have taken various options. And because of the permutation and combinations of different options, the design of each country is very different from others. So you can see on your screen other design parameters. Uh, that makes every market unique. Apart from these listed on your screen that we, you know, we have discussed these two slides in our first two modules details, I'm not going to details of these here, uh, but the other factors, for example, in case of Brazil, we have a hydro dominated system, right? So, uh, so there's a lot of reservoir based hydro. So for them, capacity is not an issue to meet the peak demand, peak load of system. However, they have the difficulty of meeting the energy. So you, you will see that once the presenter, Ricardo, will uh, discuss this uh, uh, in his uh, slide deck. And you will see that because of the composition of the generation, the market design also becomes different. So there are many other, so there's a uh, long list, but you know, we're just, this is like a high level main 10, 11 factors that we have discussed. So this makes the different markets unique in terms of their design. Well, now a very uh, short and crisp introduction to the four markets that we have selected, uh, the details will be given to the presenters. So PGM is is in US and it is uh, one of the largest uh, wholesale electricity competitive markets in the North American side. Uh, so what we can see that this is one of the RTOs there, ISO and RTOs, they, they serve about two thirds of North American population. Uh, the majority utilize a capacity market construct. However, you know, ASO, Alberta in Canada or ARCOT in USA, they are energy only markets. So at the bottom of your screen, you can see that. So even within this one region, the electricity market design varies based on the different design choices that they have taken. So the other market that we have selected is from Europe, uh, that is Spain. Well, in Europe, North Pool, Epic Spot, and OMI are all prominent electricity spot markets, uh, each serving different regions and having distinct characteristics in terms of volume and liquidity. Well, Spanish market is uh, one of the first organized wholesale market in Europe. Only UK and North Pool were established before the Spanish market. One of uh, the other thing that was different here was the regulatory reform, uh, which was without changing the ownership of characteristics of the companies. Well, in this regard, Spain had a long tradition of many electricity companies, which were never integrated into a big national company, unlike you know uh, the companies which were integrated in Italy, France, UK, or Greece. So you see the different type of institutional reforms which have been, uh, which have been done uh, in uh, European countries. So henceforth, the process therefore was very challenging since the pre-existing rights needed to be preserved. Uh, another thing that we discussed, especially when we implement the market is the concept of treatment of stranded costs. Well, uh, Spain was a pioneer to introduce this concept. And finally, Although you see on the map that Spain, Spain is integrated with other part of Europe, uh, in practice, it is an isolated system due to its geography and the limited capacity of the interconnection with other countries. The third selection that we have made is uh, from the South America, which is on your map, uh, is the example of Brazil. So in, in the South American region, you can see on the legend that the functional electricity markets are in greens. 
So within even these markets, you know, the design differs based on uh, the dispatch, which is based on cost or it's based on price, the ownership structure, and so on and so forth. So when we, when we talk about Brazil, the Brazilian power market has been organized in a unique manner because of it, its hydro dominance. Uh, about 60% of the generation mix is hydro, which create a unique challenge of zero, zero marginal cost, which has been recently experienced by other markets which have achieved higher share of variable renewable energy resources. The institutional arrangements are also very unique in Brazil, in which the government plays a major role in planning and expansion of the power grid, which is quite different from the rest of the world. One of another uh, unique feature of Brazilian power system is its experience with the comparative auctions. These auctions are considered as a global example of success uh, in international competitive bidding. So now we will move on to the final slide, which is on Indian market. Well, finally, one of the leading examples we have from South Asian markets is of India. Uh, the power dispatch in India is managed through both state and central mechanisms. Both state and central dispatch systems play a crucial role in managing India's complex power grid. IEX, which is Indian Energy Exchange, and two other power exchanges facilitate electricity trading across various markets, including day head, intraday, real time, and term head contracts. As a leading online platform in India, IEX operates spot and derivative markets. Additionally, IEX facilitates the import of electricity from neighboring countries like Nepal, Bhutan, and Bangladesh, which uh, promotes regional electric cooperation and, op and is optimizing energy resources in uh, the, the South Asian region. Well, that is all from my side uh, in setting the perspective uh, before or setting the stage for the next four presenters. Now I'm pleased to invite Mr. Dhruv uh, from IEX India to please provide insights into the Indian electricity market. Over to you, Mr. Dhruv. Thank you so much, Omar, for uh, uh, giving this interesting perspective and inviting us uh, for this for this particular panel. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Dhruv from Indian Energy Exchange. Uh, I work with distribution utilities, trading licenses, consulting and exchanges uh, so i can give you a better perspective how the overall uh, market works uh, exchange uh, is per se uh, indian energy exchange is uh, one of the largest and oldest power exchange and we have been uh, in operation since last 15 years and we started our operations back in 2008 have been growing uh, at the cagr of uh, 30% year on year i'll be taking you through the presentation on indian power markets so just give me a second i'll just uh, it on the slideshow. Uh, Omar, if you can confirm once you see the slides. Uh, yeah, you, uh, the, screen, the screen is visible. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, just to give you some perspective, it's uh, India's electricity market is one of the largest and most dynamic in the world. And uh, it's divided into uh, essentially uh, four distinct uh, categories. One is generation. Uh, the transmission, distribution, and a distinct activity called trading. And uh, the market oversight is uh, with uh, with the regulatory commission at the central level, which is Central Electricity Regulatory Commission. And there are state electricity regulatory commissions also, because uh, like Omar just mentioned, that uh, it's a complex market where both center and state has uh, distinct powers. So both, both of these uh, regulatory commissions give an oversight. And there is a system operator, uh, power system uh, operation corporation, so uh, which which basically looks into the uh, scheduling and uh, the grid stability. So the structure is uh, like uh, uh, we have a complex mix of uh, coal, gas, oil, and and now the renewable, especially the solar, is 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 take, uh, taking uh, the country by a storm. So, so the wind, hydro, and biomass are also essential. Uh, uh, essential part of the overall mix. And there is a very small percentage of the nuclear as of now. Uh, with respect to the transmission, uh, the network is managed by essentially the Power Grid Corporation of India Limited, which is uh, one of the largest uh, tra transmission companies. And, and there are also state uh, transmission utilities also, which manages the state transmission network. Uh, after the transmission, then comes the distribution, which 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 is basically responsible for supplying the electricity to the end consumers, and then the trading, wherein uh, the ex, uh, uh, the IEX role uh, is is one of the major uh, major player in in this particular activity. Along with two other exchanges, we facilitate trading through different market segments, uh, which will be covered in the subsequent slides, uh, which includes day head market, real time market, and intraday market. 
so uh, just to give you a perspective how uh, the all the stakeholders are connected so there are four oversights uh, from uh, ministry of power the central and the state regulator and and the state government under these oversight uh, all the all the market participants including the generation transmission distribution uh, they actually operate along with the power grid companies uh, the state uh, the generation may come from the state owned generation companies central power sector units uh, units independent power producers uh, and captive users uh, so if you can see the captive users can uh, sub can basically supply power directly to, the, to their own units uh, via open access uh, the concept which was uh, uh, penned in 2003 actually uh, got fully implemented post exchanges uh, uh, post 2007 uh, essentially and now a lot of uh, large and intensive uh, consumers are setting up their own captive units to uh, to keep on the benefit of um, uh, their, their own power generation uh, sourcing power from thermal or renewable based on their own uh, own targets especially in terms of uh, the uh, the renewable percentage uh, obligation which they need to uh, uh, with respect to transmission it's it's uh, at, at the uh, central level which is pgcil that, and, and at the state level which is state transmission utilities which which in turn supply power to the distribution companies these distribution companies uh, are roughly around 55 odd distribution licenses uh, in the country uh, part of them are private licenses private distribution companies but majority of them are state owned and and they essentially supply power to uh, the different segments of customers like uh, domestic commercial industrial and agriculture customers the role of power trading companies here is to basically get power or basically uh, trade power on behalf of these ipps or captives whatever they have surplus from their captive units and supply it to large consumers so this is uh, this slide basically gives you a, a basic market construct that how the ppa is or, or basically the uh, the overall power consumption of the country is divided amongst so if you, if you see around 86% uh, of of these uh, agreements are under the long term uh, agreement which uh, which are up to 25 years uh, of, of agreement and and rest around 14% is spread across three different segments out of which uh, almost 50% is with exchange where you can trade currently uh, from 1 hour in advance and up to 90 days uh, so this 90 days is expected to increase uh, up to 11 months uh, in, in coming uh, coming months 5% of the energy is, is being traded bilaterally or uh, via banking uh, between one-on-one uh, one, one -on -one contracts and uh, roughly 2% is uh, the imbalance settlement or division settlement as we call. So uh, some of the typical contracts uh, in the wholesale electricity market which are very prevalent in the country are uh, any, any contract which goes uh, seven years and above, they fall under long term. Any utility, a private utility or a government utility, can opt for a competitive bidding uh, under design, build, uh, finance, own, operate, or own and transfer uh, mechanism. Whereas medium term contracts are uh, done via competitive bidding on a platform called DEEP. It's basically a discovery of efficient uh, electricity prices, uh, wherein uh, a, a reverse auction uh, is being called. And uh, these contracts uh, under DEEP can be done. Uh, uh, from 15 days in advance up till uh, five years or depending upon uh, the basic requirement of any of the utility whereas uh, the short term market is up to one year at 365 days where uh, uh, power exchanges operate because currently we uh, we're limited with the uh, reg uh, from the regulation side that we are allowed to uh, participate up to 90 days that is third three months only uh, which uh, which will increase up to 11 months. So uh, so we'll have more area uh, to operate and uh, and basically uh, look for look for more growth over over the period uh, of time also. And any of the bilateral contract can also happen under the short term up to one year. And any deviation against the schedule uh, between a, uh, from a buyer side or from the seller side is settled on the DSM, which also uh, forms a part of the short term uh, short term. Uh, contracts and and this these these particular constitutes around two percent of the overall uh, market uh, market size some of the uh, specific design features and product of the uh, indian power sector is one of the uh, major four is open access uh, basis which most of the consumers especially the large industrial consumers whose contract demand is above a certain threshold 
they are, they are allowed to choose here uh, their supplier and uh, so this particular choice actually gives uh, uh, encouragement to the competition which has further reduced uh, the prices and uh, funneled the growth for exchanges as well as uh, bilateral contracts over a period of time. Uh, power purchase agreements are generally a long-term contracts or a medium-term contracts between a buyer and a seller. It will have certain uh, certain features like tenure, uh, price, uh, uh, the, the way the scheduling will happen, the, how the pra payment, payment mechanism would be there. And uh, there, there are model guidelines uh, from, from the regulators, but uh, buyers are uh, buyers can actually based on their requirement they can they can tweak certain certain uh, certain points and uh, if, if if there is a match between a buyer and a seller and, and they agree on terms they can go into uh, executing certain purchases. So renewable energy certificates uh, are basically some credible certificates which uh, which uh, which promotes renewable energy adoption. So uh, so there are. Uh, 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 renewable purchase obligations, uh, which are uh, standardized by the central central government, and, and under those standardization, every state has to opt and follow a, a certain uh, uh, RPO requirements. So, based on those uh, renewable purchase obligations, every state will fulfill uh, their uh, their obligations via either procuring the certificates or uh, the equivalent amount of energy, uh, which it is entitled to. So, currently, it's uh, roughly around twenty percent uh, on the country level. With respect to increase year on year as we are uh, targeting our uh, net zero targets also. So energy efficiency certificates are also on the similar lines as REC. So it's uh, it's based on a cap and trade mechanism and uh, it's, it incentivizes the energy saving initiatives. And if you can uh, re uh, reduce your specific energy consumption uh, uh, versus your threshold, then of course you, you basically get those certificates and which are tradable on the exchanges. The bilateral contracts, uh, on the other hand, uh, are uh, basically an one-on-one -on -one agreement between a buyer and a seller. A bilateral contract may or may not have a trader in between, uh, which can facilitate these contracts. And uh, the terms and conditions are mutually agreed by uh, between buyers and sellers. Uh, some of the operational dynamic uh, uh, terminologies, which 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 are dealt here in merit order dispatch, I'm sure. Uh, 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 most of you would be uh, utilizing or, or using it uh, for, uh, for for getting uh, your power plants dispatched. So generators are dispatched based on their variable cost, essentially. And load, uh, load dispatch centers uh, basically coordinate uh, on the real-time uh, demand and generation. And any, any mismatch or any deviation is basically being captured and settled by uh, LDCs or the RPCs, which are uh, regional power committees. Uh, then coming on to the demand side management, uh, it basically encourages efficient consumption, uh, uh, and there are certain DR uh, DR uh, uh, projects which have also been uh, done in India, especially in the western part of the country, uh, uh, wherein uh, demand response uh, up to 25 megawatt for certain hours was uh, was also envisaged and, and it was achieved. Uh, Market clearing price is, is pertaining to essentially the uh, the exchange uh, traded uh, price, and it it's the, it's the price at which electricity is being traded on any given fifteen minute time block. So uh, just to give you a uh, whole uh, the wholesale structure. Uh, so this slide, if you if you, if you look uh, from the generator side, so the power will flow uh, to the distribution companies. And uh, the load dispatch center uh, will get the uh, DCs from these generators. And uh, similarly, the distribution companies will also give the requisition to the LDCs. And based on the generator's DC, which is declared, cap uh, uh, declared capacity, against the requisition from the distribution companies, the LDCs used to schedule the power, and distribution companies used to basically uh, uh, give it to the end consumer. And trading companies were also uh, uh, are, are also participating in a similar kind of uh, mechanism where uh, rather than generators giving directly to the distribution companies, they can come via a, a, an exchange or a trading company, give the schedule to the LDC and actual flow of power can happen to the end consumers, which essentially would be the large uh, the large consumers uh, uh, beyond a beyond certain threshold. Uh, so uh, the initial uh, um, uh, challenges in terms of market design uh, uh, was most of the long-term contracts were inflexible, and there was there were a lot of contracts, almost 85% uh, plus 
contracts are still uh, under, under the long term where there is very very uh, less leeway uh, to kind of reduce uh, on on in terms of uh, the availability from from those power, uh, power purchase agreements lack of robust and resource planning at both central and state level and a lot of states uh, have really relied on self scheduling and uh, which impacted the overall market participation and thus the overall market cost was relatively higher and the entire uh, regulatory lamp landscape uh, was uh, relatively uh, very complex so in order to overcome this uh, electricity act 2003 was uh, envisaged and which basically delicensed the generation which has been uh, one of the most uh, uh, one of the catalyst for increased generation from uh, 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 by by cgr of uh, almost 6.7% year on year the last 7 years also uh, so initially uh, uh, omar also touched on this so we are now a multi buyer and multi seller framework in power so tariff based competitive bidding in power was also envisaged from the electricity act and 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 the further provisions of the act there too and the open access wherein any any buyer can actually uh, choose their own supplier uh, provided they meet certain threshold criteria and uh, And, and the financial criteria, they are allowed to actually participate in the in the open market, and they can come out of their existing uh, distribution licensee. Uh, which uh, prior to 2003, this particular option was not available freely with all the buyers. Uh, a concept of parallel distribution network uh, licensee was also introduced in 2003, and uh, on a pilot basis, it, it has been implemented in uh, uh, one of the city here in uh, India, uh, in Mumbai, where. Uh, Two different utilities are competing for a similar uh, same geographical area. SERCs were also uh, envisaged and commissioned post 2004 uh, after the Electricity Act, and uh, the the concept of NEP, uh, the National Electricity Policy and Tariff Policy, uh, to look out for future uh, 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 way forward in terms of electricity and uh, to make the market more. Uh, resilient uh, was also envisaged, and and this is this has come basically from the uh, enactment of Electricity Act. So uh, uh, some of the points uh, I've already covered, like open access, and uh, so the, initially the threshold for open open access was one megawatt, and any buyer uh, uh, could actually participate in the open market if, provided they have a contract with the their existing utility above one megawatt. but the recent uh, development in terms of green open access rules in june 2022 uh, has allowed uh, any consumer with 100 kilowatt or above as a contract demand uh, to participate under open access provided they they are they're getting the green energy uh, for the open access and uh, in terms of deviation settlement mechanism which is basically the imbalance mechanism uh initially uh, it was linked with a vector uh, via the uh, via the frequency where ceiling and uh, ceiling rate was also uh, uh, provided and initially the band was between 49 hertz to 50.5 hertz which was later changed to 40, uh, 49.85 hertz to 50.05 hertz and there were stringent penalties if you breach this particular frequency band recently in 22 uh there have been some changes uh, specifically in terms of linking of this vector to the frequency band It has been uh, delinked from the frequency and linked to the day ahead market price and the real time market price and and the ancillary market price so higher of these three would would become the basis for calculation of the division settlement mechanism uh in terms of developing the power markets so there have been uh, uh couple, couple of uh, regulations of uh, uh, basically the amendments 2010 regulation and then 2021 regulations which basically uh, formed the concept of setting up of the exchanges and uh, and the concept of uh, over the counter uh, platform uh, the otc markets the coupling operators and uh, uh, enhancing fo- and uh, enhances the focus of on information dissemination and oversight has also been uh, included in the power market 2021 regulations uh some of the newer segments uh, uh recently which we have introduced uh, which have taken uh, 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 uh which now which are now our main stays especially in terms of our volume growth our, our revenues as well as uh, the uh, the ease of market participation is the real time market which we uh, we launched in june 20 just uh, just during the covid period and and currently it constitutes almost 20, uh, just more than 25% of our overall uh, uh 
uh, market share from uh, in our the entire segment. Uh, green term ahead market uh, was also launched uh, in August 20, and then green day ahead market in October 21. I'll cover all these ma uh, market segments uh, briefly in my coming slides. So one new concept of uh, longer duration contracts, which, which are essentially one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one bilateral contracts, uh, was also, we, we got the approval from the regulatory commission. We launched them uh, in June 22. And uh, so, so currently these longer duration contracts are uh, up to 90 days only. And uh, we will soon have the approval up till 11 months. Once that is there, then, then, then uh, essentially uh, we'll be able to capture the audience who, who, are, who are looking to uh, lock in for a longer duration of, let's say, in the entire season of summer or, or, or the winter. So, so this has been our journey um, so far in the last 15 years, uh, introduced multiple segments. So we have our own. Uh, 17 plus uh, different segments. Uh, we, we launched uh, the market with Dehan Market, where you can uh, trade today for your tomorrow's uh, requirement or, or your tomorrow's availability. And then based on the market sentiment, uh, we also introduced a weekly contract uh, up to 11 days. Uh, you could trade in, in the term ahead market. And uh, then the certificates, uh, especially the renewable energy certificate and the e-certs were launched subsequently, uh, looking at the market, market requirement. Uh, so up till 2012, the entire energy trade being traded was done on an hourly basis. So post 2012, uh, the uh, the hourly mechanism was revised to 15 minutes in day head, day head uh, market, and we also traded our first uh, solar RECs in 2012. Uh, uh, one of the major mainstays, like like I just discussed in early 2010, uh, we launched the real time market, wherein you can, uh, as a participant, you can uh, you can participate in the market with with a one hour advance notice. And uh, we also diversified uh, from the energy domain, and we incorporated uh, Indian Gas Exchange in, in uh, 20. And uh, uh, some of the redesign in terms of uh, 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 RECs with respect to just keep keeping with, uh, in the current regulation as as well as the ministry's uh, focus in terms of redesigning the RECs. We have also relaunched and revamped the REC uh, the way RECs are traded. And, and the recent entrance is a uh, high price day ahead market, wherein certain market participants who are above uh, the, the current market uh, cap, uh, uh, the price cap of rupees 10, if, if their generation cost is above that, and essentially they have been identified as imported coal based, imported RLNG or uh, uh, gas based, and uh, battery energy storage systems. Uh, they can participate as a seller in a high price day market, whereas any buyer is free to participate based on their requirements. So this has been our journey over the period. Uh, so uh, with respect to the current uh, electricity generation, uh, uh, in terms of installed capacity, uh, we are at almost uh, 430 gigawatt, uh, out of which around 50% is coming from the fossil fuel. And uh, RE plus hydro is close to 43%. And if you, if you look closely, 188 gigawatt is coming from the renewable energy. That's where the focus of the government is. Out of this 188, 133 uh, gigawatt, uh, close to 133 gigawatt is uh, wind plus side, or sorry, wind plus solar. And uh, additional capacity of around 27 gigawatt is expected to come online. And uh, the focus of the government also is that 50% non fossil fuel uh, based generation sh uh, we should achieve by 2030. Uh, in terms of the transmission network, we have the world's largest network with an integrated. Uh, Interregional trans, uh, transfer capability of 112 gigawatts with 44.72 lakh circuit kilometers uh, of transmission lines. There is a dedicated green corridor for RE rich states. Uh, so, for specifically, the, for the projects who need evacuation uh, because of the high density of the renewable energy in that specific region. So, up till 2016, uh, we had congestion specifically in the southern region, and then we started experiencing it in the uh, Northern Indian, specifically in one state for certain months. And uh, so there have been some uh, revamp in terms of international capacity, which has been updated. Uh, uh, so now uh, uh, we, we are experiencing the congestion only uh, for 0.1%, less than 0.1% of the times uh, in, in the system. And uh, we're truly one nation, one grid at one price. 
So in terms of distribution and consumption, there have been a lot of reforms which have been done. Uh, so the current uh, ATNC losses uh, are at around 15% uh, uh, down from uh, uh, last two years, which was 22% in uh, FY21. So essentially this has been done due to a lot of uh, uh, revamp in terms of uh, distribution infrastructure and new schemes which have been infused into this uh, just to keep the ATNC losses uh, down. In terms of electrification uh, as decarbonization level, uh, EVA cooking and traction are being uh, focused upon. So if, if you looked uh, at this particular slide, the current market uh, for FI23 was around 13% uh, of the overall uh, consumption was through short-term market, out of which 6.8, which is close to 50%, was coming on the exchanges. So uh, this has considerably increased since 2016. So if you see uh, the, the graph increase in, uh, in the share of exchanges in the total consumption in the blue, from 3.2% in FY16 to almost 7.1% up till H1 of this financial year. So, uh, so last year, it, uh, uh, we faced a, a, a slight dip. That was essentially because the overall market prices were high because of a lot of levers which were uh, pulling the prices up, especially the uh, the imported coal and uh, the gas-based uh, power plants had a higher cost of generation. And almost all the states who were earlier participating specifically for optimization, they could not do because the overall costs were high. Uh, but we are expecting this particular prices to ease out in the coming years and uh, which will essentially uh, uh, give, give a, a larger share in terms of the overall short term. So this, this uh, probably slide is self-explanatory. You can see the exchanges have grown in the last six, seven years at the CAGR of 14%, uh, whereas bilateral and DSM have, uh, uh, have performed at 25 and 1.3% respectively. So just to give you a perspective of uh, what an exchange, uh, uh, specifically uh, uh, the way we operate is we are a neutral uh, trade platform. There is no influence specifically in terms of price dis determination. And it's it's absolutely, it's 100% voluntary exchange. Uh, anybody uh, who has the permissions from the nodal agencies can participate uh, purely on their choice. Uh, it's competitive and anonymous. Both buy and sell are independent of each other. We have uh, oversight from the Central Electricity Regulatory Commissions and the risk, uh, uh, risk management is on the exchanges part. And we work as a counterparty for risk uh, in terms of uh, financial as well as the delivery risk. And uh, we, we operate in our end transmission uh, margins. So these are different markets uh, segments which we operate in. We started, uh, if you look on the left hand uh, side, top corner, that's where we started day, a day ahead market. Uh, and, and we started it in 2008. So now it's a 15 minute uh, contract on a daily basis. The price is discovered on a closed double sided auction. Uh, and it's it's basically now an integrated market where uh, we're basically uh, first the GDAP, the green market, uh, 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 bidding is considered. So uh, every day between 10 a.m. to 11 a.m., any participant can participate uh, based on the requisition. Uh, at, and at 11 a.m., we, uh, we close up the bidding window closes. And by 1 p.m., we publish the result uh, in, a, in a methodology that first the green market gets cleared, and then at any spillover, if uh, there is any from the seller that they don't want to, uh, uh, they want to carry forward their bids to the day head market they can they can opt that particular option similar with the buyer also they can uh, also participate in both the market gdam and dam and similarly for hp dam uh, only the sellers uh, uh, which we earlier mentioned uh, they are on high price uh, approval from the nodal agency they can participate and any buyer can participate uh, provided they have the requirement in, in that particular segment it's an integrated market opens between 10 a.m to 11 every day uh, for trade delivery for the next day uh, and the results are published by 1 p.m. the same day and uh, uh, the provisional results are published by 1 p.m. and the final results by 3 p.m. for the next day. And uh, then uh, uh, then our mainstay uh, market is also the real-time market where also the price is being discovered on double-sided closed auction, uniform prices. It's uh, it, it runs for 48 times in a day 
uh, with one hour notice and each uh, each uh, each session is for 30 minutes uh, so basically two 15 minutes uh, club together so uh, this constitutes to close to 28 percent of our overall market size uh, then, then then we have a one-on-one -on -one kind of a contracts uh, in, in uh, intraday market and contingency market the term ahead market where buyers and sellers are identified and uh, especially in intraday and con uh, contingency segment market, it's a uh, continuous matching basis uh, uh, where, where uh, buyer and seller both can participate at any any point in time. And, and the bidding window for contingency market is basically the day ahead contingency market opens at 12 and closes uh, uh, closes at uh, at the bidding hours of uh, 7:30 p.m. Uh, so that the trade for next day zero zero hours can be uh, constituted. Similarly, term ahead contracts, uh, which are which are up to three months, can happen in in a daily contract. So you can you can day uh, do a daily contract. You you can have a weekly contract from Monday to Sunday, and also have a, a monthly contract for the entire month. And, and uh, th there is a unique option of uh, any day single sided reverse auction. Wherein you can uh, basically participate, uh, uh, you can float your inquiry as a buyer that you want to participate for a certain duration or certain uh, time blocks, and uh, the market participants get informed via via our circulars and they can participate uh, in the reverse auction mechanism. And and the best rates uh, 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 get uh, floated uh, once the auction window closes. Uh, the the results are communicated to the buyer, and buyer is free to choose or reject uh, up to their bucket. Uh, whatever position they have they have given and that uh, we have seen a tremendous growth in this specific segment uh, of almost 500 times uh, in, over the last year when we, when we launched this uh, back in june 22 so all these uh, segments are also available in the green uh, green segment however uh, being one on one contract and uh, no revision being available for these these green sellers so we, we are seeing limited liquidity in this particular segment for, for, for green players. So in terms of electricity, uh, uh, these are the products which we have. And in terms of certificate, we have renewable energy certificates and energy saving certificates. So uh, uh, the buyers and sellers based on their voluntary uh, or uh, based on the obligation, they can come on and, and uh, come on to this market and participate as a buyer. So this is the product mix uh, as of this financial year. So if you see uh, the day head market, which had almost 100% share uh, back in 2008 when we started, has reduced considerably because of the uh, essentially the intermittency and 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 the buyers or participant looking to get more closer to the delivery. That is why a real time market has uh, garnered a, a handsome share of around 28%. The term head market is close to 15%, where you can trade for. Uh, for a certain set of period uh, on one on one basis or we are uh, any day single sided reverse auction basis so some of our growth drivers uh, over the years have been certainly the rtm the green markets the cross border transactions which started in 2021 now we are trading with countries like nepal bhutan and bangladesh and uh, the term ahead contracts which we which we started in june 22 uh, has been one of uh, one of our leading uh, market segments uh, in this financial year specifically and hp dam is essentially to cater to certain uh, high price uh, players uh, and essentially there are times when the buyer wants even at higher prices and and, and they were limited with terms of uh, the market price being capped they were not able to uh, uh, get certain trans uh, transaction because those donators had a, a, a minimum threshold of uh, above 10 rupees. So, so a new market was created based on the suggestion from the Ministry of Power, and which we started uh, last year in March 23. But not much of the traction as we have, we have seen over in that particular segment as of now. So in terms of new capacity, uh, so in new products, uh, we, are, we are working uh, to, uh, to have CFDs, uh, ancillary markets, and uh, we are promoting a renewable capacity, which uh, as, as a merchant capacity that they should come on exchange and participate in, in different products. Uh, and we, we're working towards launching the derivatives. Uh, so we, we, we don't have a derivative market as of now, uh, but uh, this particular market will bring in more liquidity and uh, it will also result in uh, leading the lower, uh, uh, the volatility of the prices. However, uh, the market will be launched at a separate exchange uh, 
as of now it's it's not launched uh, over just to uh, correct you initially you mentioned that uh, the derivatives are being also launched so, so we are in the process as a country to, to launch this particular segment so working on the capacity market also so uh, as of now uh, so the, uh, these are a, a more of a wish list uh, that, that we want to see it in this financial year uh, in terms of uh, launching the new business the gas mark gas exchange we launched in 2020 and it has seen a robust growth uh, uh, in the last two three years and we are expecting to uh, to grow it uh, even stronger in the in, in in the next five years we have also launched a carbon exchange uh, which is a wholly owned subsidiary uh, which we incorporated in 2022 and uh, and the icx is exploring on the business opportunities specifically in the space of uh, voluntary carbon market and uh, we're also exploring uh, the coal exchange opportunity and, and other opportunities uh, in energy marketplace uh, some of our growth drivers, which we see uh, in in uh, in coming years, specifically would be virtual PPS. Uh, I'm sure every one of you are uh, uh, specifically uh, in 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 Europe and US. Uh, these kind of concepts would, would already uh, be in place. So there are large consumers, uh, uh, especially the uh, the MNCs, they they're looking into this particular segment of virtual PPS. And, uh, and and the next uh, next big thing currently in India is uh, uh, FTRE, which is firm dispatchable renewable power uh, uh, through RE plus BESS, uh, 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 which will uh, give uh, uh, give the stability to the grid as well as uh, a better realization in terms of uh, the IRR for all these uh, developers. So we are working with uh, uh, Seki, which is uh, one of the nodal agencies for. Uh, Developing the, the market in terms of renewable uh, eco space, and uh, we're also working with uh, in which which are other two uh, major players, specifically working in uh, uh, battery energy storage system and uh, renewable energy integration. Uh, so CFDs, uh, we're also uh, working for one of the models uh, wherein uh, we could provide a long-term stable prices. Uh, so 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 we so we're working with. with some of the market players in uh, developing this particular market, uh, specifically for RE as of now. Uh, and uh, P2P is uh, a relatively uh, a newcomer in, in here, wherein one of the state has come up with the guideline, uh, 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 which basically encompasses that how P2P trading would happen at, at, at in, in a small geographical uh, location. And we expect to see a lot of traction on this particular space. Uh, so, in terms of net zero target, uh, we uh, uh, the COP26 target, uh, we pledged that 500 gigawatt of non fossil uh, fuel uh, will come uh, from the energy capacity by 2030, and 50% of its energy requirement uh, will be met via renewable energy. And uh, one of the uh, mainstays of this, uh, or, or the, uh, one of the major points of COP26 announcement was reduction of carbon intensity of the economy by 45% by 2030. Over 2005 level, uh, levels and uh, the uh, net zero emission by 2070. In order to achieve this, uh, we are working on on different fronts, specifically in terms of green hydrogen and electrification. So we've already grown by the rate CAGR of 6.5 percent uh, in terms of peak demand from 36 gigawatt to 240 gigawatt, and uh, further insights in specifically in terms of renewable energy over the next few years. Few years would be. Uh, or addition of around 15 gigawatt year on year. Uh, and, and a lot of thrust is being given on pumped hydro and battery energy storage system to bring in more flexible generation resources and uh, modernization and digitalization of the grid uh, for resilience, efficiency, and reliability is also right. And if you look at the, uh, the latest announcements, specifically in the budgets, the government is focused uh, specifically in more renewable energy and environmental stewardship. So uh, emphasis on uh, green energy and technological advancements uh, is the way forward, uh, which we also consider would be helpful in achieving our net zero targets. Uh, so I hope I'm in time, uh, Omar. Uh, this is uh, from my end. Hello, everyone. I am Taha from CPPA. Thank you, Mr. Dhruv, for sharing the valuable insights of the Indian electricity market. Your presentation was quite informative and engaging. Now I would like to invite Tim to provide us with an overview of PJM interconnection. Over to you, Mr. Tim. Yeah, and meanwhile, Tim, uh, 
comes in duruf excellent presentation really appreciate it it was well in time very informative and we look forward to engaging with you in the future as well thanks a lot thank you so much thank you thank you if not please let me know but today i'd like first of all thanks for having me here i think this is a great opportunity i'm like looking forward to listening to the other areas of the world and, and the markets and how they evolved and some of the lessons learned. Certainly a, a great uh, program you got here going um, through Apex, Omer, and, and the group. So thank you. Uh, what I'd like to do today is a little bit of a different flavor of, um, of a presentation, meaning uh, if you look at the PJM markets here, uh, we've been around PJM for a long time. And this slide is an extremely busy slide, as you could tell. It's been uh, the involvement of PJM, technically, you could say, started back in the 1920s. And what you're seeing on the screen is an evolution of, on the left side, is more of like the policy type changes to get to the point where PJM formed an actual market. And I'd ex I'll explain that a little through the next few slides. But then as you evolve all the way to uh, pretty much present time, all the addition, additional components PGM added to their markets to get to the point where we are now. Now, obviously, I'm not going to have enough time to go through every one of these blocks and all everything that's evolved over the PGM time. But I like to cut into some of the main highlights and then maybe touch on a little lessons learned through those highlights. And then uh, certainly you can take questions at the end if we have time or uh, during the next break. So looking at this slide here on the left there, and, I, and I'll revisit this slide a couple of times throughout the presentation because I know it's a real busy one, just to, to flavor for where we are on the timeline. So from a PGM perspective in the United States, uh, it really back in, in the 1927, the state of Pennsylvania and the state of New Jersey on the East Coast of the United States really came together to form what you would call the original type PJM part, a uh, very simple power pool where they just shared generation resources. And that was it, you know, ver vertically integrated, uh, just sharing some resources there to kind of uh, leverage each other's uh, geog geography uh, location there. So, before I get back to the timeline, let's get, like I said, this is not a total history lesson, but uh, I think it, it's valid to help uh, get us to where PJM markets are now. Uh, back in the 20s in PJM, there was two folks, um, two professors, uh, one from Princeton, I'm not sure where the other one is, uh, Malcolm McLaren and Farley Osgood. These two folks came together and they realized the power, they wrote a paper realizing the power of pool in different areas together to to utilize generation um, in a certain area within the Pennsylvania, New Jersey area. And they developed this proposal and it would save over up to three million dollars. And if you look in the middle there, so they call it the ring, but it looks more like a block. And it's really connecting major areas into the Philadelphia area, the major city area on the East Coast, bringing uh, generation into that area by creating this transmission ring and within that was able to develop a somewhat of a power pool where you got these areas that are out different uh owners different transmission owners sharing resources and bringing them into the major city area and be able to save money there so that was kind of like the first like brought into pgm like hey this is very powerful how can we in the United States too, how can we save power by uh, sharing resources there? In the early state in these areas, uh, it wasn't a power pool as far as uh, generation, um, planning, um, resources, independent operators. It was more still very vertically integrated where the uh, supplier of the power was also delivering the energy to load mainly in their area, but also they owned the transmission. So it was extremely vertically integrated where a monopoly was within each area. However, there was some type of reserve sharing agreements between the areas to ensure that, hey, if my, the area next to me needed extra energy, we can supply and help share that. And there was a, a small flavor of coordinated transmission planning within there too. 
trying to go through my timeline quickly here. In the 1950s is when uh, multiple uh, areas joined PJM. So besides just Pennsylvania, New Jersey, uh, we had areas in the western part of Pennsylvania, uh, in the Baltimore area, uh, not in New York, but in the northern Pennsylvania area. So the geography of PJM really started to grow in the 1950s, uh, which really led uh, to the development of the potential for these to really have savings in these power pools. And just continuing on there, at this time in the, uh, in the 1980s, so now I'm really fast forwarding here, in the 1980s, PJM expanded and we really included all these states that you're seeing uh, on the map here. But it was still an area where all the PJM participants were also the transmission owners. So the transmission owners, they had the generation, they had they own the lines and it was serving the load, but it was still somewhat of a it was somewhat of a shared energy, but it still wasn't a full like regional transmission organization as we call them in the United States, where it's actually uh, we got independent power producers and whatnot. So it was slowly evolving into that to that phase. So going back to our wonderful timeline here, you know, this is where I would like to really touch on the policy stuffs. So this is now where the Federal Energy Commission, and it was in 1992 and 1996, was really where the Energy Commission in the United States started really learning the, the, the value and the power of, you know, pooling these areas together. And they started to develop some regulations, some laws around how, how can we force this issue to make sure that there could be savings to the customers at the end. So the main orders for the, at least for the United States, the Eastern United States specifically, uh, that really led to the development and the, the, for PJM particularly to really expand and also areas like uh, uh, Midwest ISO, MISO, ISO, New England, um, even Cal ISO, the different regional transmission organizations within PJM. It really, a lot of it started with uh, the Federal Energy Commission. And there was an Energy, Energy Policy Act in 1992. And that act really promoted the development of spot markets in the electric power because it required facilities to open their actual transmission facilities to the entire wholesale power market. And, and when that happened, it really opened the door to really to where we are today, uh, the development of some of these things. FERC actually developed, a, a, they had like a, what they called a standard market design back in, in, in around this time, a little bit after this time too, to really look at how, what requirements would be involved in an actual market, you know, for a regional transmission organization. And they would include things like uh, the real-time market or day-ahead markets, congestion and revenue rights markets, uh, resource adequacy requirements, really developing a framework for uh, within the United States to develop these RTOs and whatnot. So you can see what we're trying to show here is an involvement of, for example, with phones, where there were rotary phones, push button, you get the little more uh, flavor on those phones. And then to the point where now in retail access, they get all the mobile type phones. So it's very uh, comparable to there. Uh, you can look at it that way. So going back to um, where we went next is this is where we start to look at once uh, this Power Act was uh, put out there from FERC, at least from a PGM perspective and the other areas within the United States, we started to see the development of you know, separate energy markers, independent power producers, alternate load servant entities, versus it wasn't vertically integrated where the transmission owners own everything, now you're going to have someone who just wants to, you know, invest in generation and that generation would connect to the power pool, uh, similar to how we have it now. We'd have the energy marketers come in, financial traders come in where that has really started unbundling the service to a whole set of uh, market participants. And I think this is where we really started evolving to where PJN was actually developed at the time. So looking at the organized markets from a PJM perspective, when they were developed, uh, there was really looking at multiple aspects. The most important part was reliability. 
and reliability was driven a lot by locational prices, LMP prices. Uh, PGM started with zonal LMP prices, evolved into um, nodal pricing. And with that information from the pricing, it really helped to drive reliability where the generators would follow the, uh, the pricing that was given to them. And it, it was not only an efficient market, but it helps with reliability. The, uh, the exchange of information was extremely important, being transparent to members, uh, providing that uh, those systems, for example, the PGM emergency management system was a huge um, thing that was added to PJM back. Uh, it was even back when the market was developed. Um, that was developed to really give this price signals. And, and then we can also get the metering from all the generators, all the information. And it was a high cost to provide all that information or to develop all these um, transparency, the computers, the EMS system, but it still saved uh, customers an enormous amount of money because as you can saw on the previous slide, the PGM region was really getting larger. So the economies of scale really came into play there. So with that, uh, organized competitive markets was really a reduction in the cost of customers. Um, we were able to share resources among the different areas. Uh, it helped reduce the required reserve margins. So versus a single transmission owner who was developing and they had their requirements for their own reserves. You know, when you come into the whole power pool and you have maybe 12 to 15 entities in there, it's just one single dispatch. And then the reserve requirements went down, which saved a significant amount of money. Um, the, the increase in the lower price, diverse supplier resources is also important because some areas within the PGM market, before they came into a power pool, you know, they would only have access to maybe uh, back then it would just be coal resources that were more expensive. They might not have had access to lower cost nuclear or even hydro back then. So. Definitely the economies of scale and the amount of uh, area really helped with in, in the PGM market. Last part of the PGM uh, market, which really helped when we came in as a pool, was the planning process. PGM has historically and continues to have a 15 uh, forward looking planning process where we're looking now 15 years into the future. Uh, PJM runs the actual planning processes in coordination with our transmission owners to make sure that any transmission upgrades come into the system would either be, you know, for reliability, which is a majority of our upgrades that come into our transmission upgrades that come into PJM. There's also economic upgrades. We actually have upgrades that come into PJM system purely based on economics if they can save customers money in the future. And then we also have operational type upgrades, which would be upgrades that would be more short term type upgrades if we have operational concerns, like a special protection schema type uh, thing put in there. But that is another component of the PGM market, which I'm not going to go too much into in this presentation, but that is a component we have within PGM. So now that everyone knows the history of PGM and some of the aspects there, uh, let's get into some of the market implementations within PJM. So going back to our wonderful uh, eyesore of a slide here, um, I'm going to jump right into some of the actual markets, uh, try to touch base on the high market areas here, and I can certainly take questions or, or follow up on any of the other areas here. So. Before I jump into specifics for the markets, let's focus on what the PJM market design philosophy was. And this is still that today, where market prices should reflect actual operating conditions. So in a perfect theoretical world, all the prices we see within our locational marginal pricing would reflect, you know, the need or, or the price signals in that area. Higher costs would uh, be associated with congestion. Uh, areas where we have less generation would provide that price signal potentially to investments for generation and, and whatnot there. So the, the market participants in this case are the partners with the RTO to maintain their reliability through the price signals. Uh, and the result for this for, for the, part, the market participants, specifically the physical participants, was that uh, 
they would get transmission hedges, 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 which would be more valuable than actual congestion exposure. And that, of course, would be some of the, the financial transmission rights or the congestion hedging rights. Uh, the transfer capability on the transmission system would also be maximized as, as the pool of uh, resources is, is more available and across the entire area. But bilateral trades would also be still part of the market, and they still are today, where they properly form the bulk of the market activity. So from a PGM markets perspective, you can really look at uh, our involvement as an RTO, a PGM regional transmission organization, uh, where our heavy or to our lighter involvement would be is PGM's main involvement is in the PGM grid, uh, making sure it's reliable, uh, working with the members on a, on a, a real-time basis there. And then as we get into the PJM markets, you know, the real time market the ancillary services, which include like spinning reserves, regulation, uh, black start services, things like that would all be within the uh, high involvement. And then as we get into like uh, forward looking, you know, we have our day ahead market. We have our reliability pricing model, which is our capacity model, which I will discuss in a couple of slides. We have our FTR market, which is our congestion rights market, which um, we have short term and a long term market for that that has evolved over the many years. And then as you go out farther, where PGM is less involvement would be like the pure financial markets where the swaps, the spreads dealing with uh, financial institutions that are not directly involved in the market, but they use the results from our market to do side trades or power trades that are not particularly with PJM involved that but they do are highly impacted by the pgm market so let's jump into some of the markets uh, from the pgm perspective in in 1998-99 area um, pgm really that's when we developed the markets and the first thing we developed what we have is the bread and butter of our markets is the real-time energy market and financial transmission rights and all the real-time markets, the LMP was based on the um, guy named F.C. Schwemps. I probably um, mispronounced his name, but he was really kind of like the inventor of LMP. I um, most people, a lot of people would say. And then uh, Bill Hogan, who's also was highly involved in LMP, uh, helped develop the financial transmission rights. And Hogan has been involved, or, or used to be involved in a lot of PGM activities for many years. A uh, very nice guy and a uh, really smart. Uh, but the LMP, when we developed the LMP, was purely real-time energy market. We did not have a day-ahead energy market at the time, and the LMP provided the most direct, efficient price signals. I believe in PJM we were zonal only for about a year, maybe, and then we moved to nodal for LMPs. But it was designed in such a manner to maximize the revenues if the generation resources would follow the PJM dispatch instructions. So there's incentives there. For the uh, resources to follow the PGM LMP signals uh, to get the most efficient. There were shortcomings, though, for the LMP market. As I mentioned, we didn't have a look ahead market at that time. Originally, it was zonal, so that was another shortcoming. And as we evolved, we realized that um, there needed to be more additional things versus LMP, where LMP should not be a standalone to recover your costs. From a PGM perspective, we, we had to look farther at some of the ancillary type markets and also the capacity market. So it, it was very small to begin with, with the LMP market, uh, but we definitely uh, improved from there and increased. But at the same time, in 1999 is when the financial transmission rights came about. These are the congestion revenue rights in our market. And they were very important because almost all, or, or 80, 90%, of all the energy trade in the PJM market was associated with bilateral trades. So trading across uh, from specific source to a specific sink or load zone. And anytime there was a LMP price difference, there was congestion and the, the FTRs would help insulate them from that congestion because they would receive a rebate. Moving on to 2000, the year 2000 is when PGM developed the day ahead energy market. And this was our look ahead market one day ahead. Uh, and the rationale was uh, help for risk mitigation for a look ahead. Um, and, our, and the PGM day market 
is basically the same as it was back in 2000. We have changed the timing of the market as far as when it clears to improve that. But it's still a next day look ahead. Uh, it really has increased uh, competition in the PGM market. We actually allow virtual trading, which are our folks. We're a market participants who have no um, no assets at all. They're just trading on the market. But if the market is designed appropriately and the model on is appropriately, that virtual trading should help converge the prices between day ahead and real time. And, and there's some um, different theories on that, which I won't get into, but uh, they are part of our market now. Um, I would say that some of the lessons learned as I get through some of them would be within our day ahead market, some of the options we made available for virtual trading, where uh, we allow a significant amount of uh, points or, or nodal points to be available for virtual trading, where in hindsight, maybe we should have uh, tailored that down a little bit. But um, as many know, once you offer a product in a market, it's hard to remove a product. So that is one of the lessons learned, at least uh, discussed later about products being offered in a market that uh, PJM versus other RTOs, since we've been really early in, in, the, in the process, it's a little bit more difficult for to remove products from the system. Um, so yeah, so day ahead, as many know, and you probably had education on it, is a two settlement process, provides strong incentives to follow the real time dispatch. And uh, for PJM, it's been largely unchanged. Uh, except for the timing of it. So we did change our market, as you can see on this slide, in 2015 to reduce the day ahead market clearing time, where we realized, and it wasn't just PJM, that participants would tell us that hey, if you would clear your market faster or even earlier, we can reduce um, the risk associated with generation and, and gas generators who are procuring fuel for the next day because the quicker they can get the information, they can uh, procure their fewer contracts and save a lot of money there. So timing was critical for the gas industry to help reduce uh, the risk associated with gas and to uh, offer uh, savings to customers. And we did realize based on some theoretical analysis we did there back then that um, the reduction in the risk profile that gas generators were put in their offers uh, whether it was 0.5% up to 3%, there was significant cost savings to the members. So reducing reducing that risk to the generators for um, what they would put into their offers was a significant improvement in the market that um, saved customers uh, millions of dollars. And I talk about millions of dollars within the PJM market. Million, PJM is going through like a billion dollars a day in, in markets. Um, in in different areas. So I understand the magnitude of millions there compared to some areas might be significantly different. So you got to take it into the respect of uh, where PGM's total size is compared to other areas. The next area I wanted to cover is the regulation market and the evolution of that. Uh, PGM actually had regulation back in 1998, but it wasn't market-based. Uh, there was two regulation signals, uh, Reg A and Reg B. And they were used for hydroelectric units, and it was based on how quickly they could uh, react the two different um, units. Uh, but it wasn't until year 2000 when PGM actually implemented the regulation market. Since 2000, uh, multiple areas have joined PJM uh, within uh, the different Pennsylvania. Um, Illinois area, southern areas in Virginia, uh, Ohio. As we expand it more, we realized we really needed to expand the system to have our actual regulation market. So as the footprint expanded, um, we realized we wanted to move to an RTO-wide regulation market and we can utilize all these different areas to help with regulation. So eventually at a point in 2012, when FERC put out an order and FERC for reminders, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission in the United States, they're the ones that came up with the original Energy, Energy Policy Act that I discussed earlier. They required performance-based regulation. And uh, that also at that point would be on uh, PGM's market. We had a Regulation A and a Regulation D signals. And that's really based on the how fast uh, a unit can perform 
depending on the signal that would be given. And we were able to decrease the regulation requirement across the entire footprint because of this uh, change. And for the most part, regulation market hasn't changed since then. We are flirting with potential changes now, um, but that's still in our stakeholder process. So moving on to the capacity market, uh, capacity market is obviously it's been um, a, a long way for PJM and many markets don't have capacity markets, obviously, but PJM uh, a while back uh, when we developed the, the RPM market in 2006, 2007, but even before then, PJM always had a capacity market, but I would put markets in the quote because we really would just secure enough uh, capacity, made sure on a daily basis we had enough capacity to meet our uh, our load requirements for a particular day, and that was on capacity. It wasn't really a forward-looking market per se, because when PGM developed the real-time market back in the day when we had all those uh, power pools, there was a lot of generators that came in very quickly, and PGM was really long on generation, a lot more generation than uh, we needed. So there wasn't really a concern to have a, a major capacity market. But when you think of capacity, you think of it, it's a commitment of a resource to provide energy from during a PGM emergency. So we wanna make sure we have that, um, we have that iron in the ground, we have that generation that's ready to go, even though it might not be economic, but if we need that in an emergency situation, that that is available to the PGM market. So that is from a capacity standpoint, uh, we have that long-term commitment. And then obviously in the energy is on a real-time tape market, daily, hourly type, where that product is bidding in the market and we're hoping you know, it's gonna be available. And then a third component of capacity energy is the ancillary services. But from a PGM perspective, that's a very small percentage, like less than 5% of the market. But the capacity market, like I said, it evolved. In 2006, 2007, we really started to notice, or even before then, that this whole excitement with deregulation, it started to, um, it created an irrational overbuild of generation, as I mentioned before, but that stopped. But all of a sudden, there wasn't new generation being built. The prices in the economic, in the energy market, wasn't enough to incentivize new generation being built. So we really needed, uh, from a PGM perspective, a capacity market, a forward looking ahead to provide those signals and that missing money piece, as far as many would say, as far as the money of capacity to help meet the requirements um, for a generator for their full uh, revenue. So load kept growing and then PGM um, detected reliability violations in the future. And then we developed the reliability pricing model, which is this long term pricing signal. And this reliability pricing model is probably the most controversial thing that PGM ever added, and it continues to uh, evolve um, to this day. Uh, but I would say it has been successful in procuring a significant amount of generation in the, in the PGM market. So when you think of, and I didn't go through all the different components throughout the many 20, 30 years since we've been developing the market components, because like I said, that would just take too long. But uh, I tried to touch on a little bit in each of the areas that we have on the screen here, where from a resource adequacy, that's our capacity market in PJM, we're looking three years out into the future. Uh, the transportation that you look at, think like that congestion revenue rights to hedge uh, movement energy across our transmission systems. We offer them in a one-year product out in the future, but we also offer FTRs for our congestion hedging rights in a three-year out future too. And then when you look at the single day, we're really narrowing close to the market. We have our day ahead market, and then we have our real-time ops, and then our ancillary services is that those on the five-minute basis. Our day ahead market there doesn't clear at 4 p.m. So right anymore, we did change that. Uh, we, we moved it earlier, so I believe we clear our market um, I'm going to say by 1.30, if I remember correctly, but it's definitely earlier in the day. So going back to the evolution of the PJM market, uh, th these were the slides I, I provided earlier, but to, to touch on these 
thing that I did not touch on very quickly on this slide, um, PGM also added uh, demand response. So if you look on the slide in like the 2000, 2001 area, uh, at first we had a pilot program for load reduction where they're really, they were revenues to be paid, but it wasn't really incorporated within our market. In 2001, the, um, we actually developed it more in our market. Uh, we had economic load reduction program where you can actually participate in the markets from a, a load reduction perspective. PGM's uh, participation or, or participation in the, the demand response market now from an economic perspective is still pretty light, but uh, it is very valuable in emergency situations, uh, the load reduction or demand response as PGM would call it. From a financial transmission perspective or, or congestion revenue rights, as many folks would call them, PGM did add some uh, future products in the annual uh, product, different options to choose from. Um, this is one of the areas where I personally feel and I've been involved with most of my career that we went, we added too much too quickly. Um, and I, I think a lot of the other areas or within the countries or in the, within the United States at least have learned from PGM to not offer some of these products because some of the products PGM offers, uh, I think that we went a little too far too quickly. And then in hindsight, we maybe should have um, backed away from that a little bit. Uh, PGM also in 2011, we have an advanced control center now where um, if there's anything goes on with our main control center from a catastrophe perspective, terrorist perspective, uh, whatever it would be, we everything would fail to our backup control center, uh, which is a couple hundred miles less than a couple hundred miles from our, our main control center where we can operate our entire the entire grid from our backup control center so just a couple more slides here uh, of what's next and some of the lessons learned as we as you move on here we're starting to see hello we've been seeing a shift in uh, revenues in our market from uh, historically the energy market provided the most revenue. So on this slide, you see back in 2006, you know, 100% of the revenues because we didn't have the RPM market was coming basically from the energy market. Um, but then as the years go on, we're starting to see more and more revenues coming from the capacity market. So units or generators are recovering a lot of their costs through the capacity market instead of the energy market. And PGM doesn't feel this is the appropriate way to go. We think the energy market needs to provide those price signals um, to help for investments. Uh, we need to value these resources that are uh, more flexible um, in those type of areas. So when we saw this shift, we started to do some price formation type changes, or at least attempt to do them. And we are still working and still trying to drive some more changes in these areas. One of the areas, and I'm going to go through three very quickly, is uh, subsidies. So subsidies within the PGM market, um, if you think about it this time, in a perfect world, you're not going to have these outside factors that are impacting you know, investments and generation. But that's not how we work in the real world. And in, in in what happens, at least in the United States, I know it happens in other areas too. The government steps in. The government might say, hey, we have these uh, generator resources that are important in this specific area. And it might be just because they provide uh, low emissions. They could be generators that uh, you need it for, um, for jobs. You know, they're very important to the area. But whatever the factor would be, you know, you're having the government step in in certain of these states and saying, we're going to pay these generators money to stay online, even if they're not making money in the market. So that really disrupts the whole economic theory and how we deal with the markets where, you know, it's all about competition in the markets and providing it. So what it does is in our market, specifically in the capacity market, it'll suppress the market clearing prices. So now we have these signals where you have a stack of generators that would normally clear in our capacity market. But now you have this generator over here that's not economic, that clears, and it pushes out more economic resources from not clearing because of the subsidies. So it really disrupts the way the market is. 
So PJM, and this still happens today, and we tried to account for this um, by creating a capacity repricing proposal that we put out there, but it was rejected by FERC ultimately. So our repricing proposal, and I'm, I'm mentioning this just for, to provide some flavor of how we evolve and, and some lesson learned for everyone, where we went in there and we said, let's do a repricing proposal. And uh, uh, based on this slide, you could see that you know those two units A and B they're uncompetitive, but they would normally clear in the market, and because of the subsidies provided by the states, this out of market money. Uh, the idea with the repricing proposal was to change it so these uh, units would not impact the pricing, and those price signals would still be there. We know they're going to be part of the market, but if they if we have new resources that can come in and would impact the prices and they could clear economically, then that would be okay. Uh, but it didn't work. And this was a situation where the theoretical perfect solution, as one might say, or maybe it's not, but regardless, it didn't work. And this was um, this was a challenge at PJM. So we moved on from there. Some of the other areas we have here is more on the energy market. Energy price formation is fast start pricing. And I know I'm running out of time here, so I only have a couple more slides. But we, we were successfully able to implement fast start pricing, which is pricing that reflects um, you know, value in those resources that are uh, more flexible uh, or, or not flexible, but are important to the system. So we were able to, we, what we now have is two pricing mechanisms. We have our original pricing mechanism that's based on what's actually on the system, but then we have this separate pricing run where we allow these fast start resources, resources that can start up within 30 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour real quickly. We allow them to actually set price on the system now, where before they couldn't set price because they weren't as flexible system. And then lastly, um, was the uh, carbon pricing. And this is a process I'm not gonna get into, but we are still reviewing, looking at carbon pricing in the different regions and the markets to help uh, and sanitize uh, low carbon resources. This is a really slow progress. And I would say uh, we're at least five years away from anything in this area. So very quickly, lessons learned on my perspective. I don't wanna say it's a PJM perspective, but from Tin's perspective, um, First is not always best, in my opinion. Uh, I've learned, I've been with PJM for 22 years now. And uh, when I started, it was mainly just PJM. MISO was still evolving, uh, SPP, which are other areas within the United States. They would come to PJM and be like, hey, you know, what, what's the best way to do this? We'd work with our partners. And there's no competition, we're all working together here. And we'd help them out. and. By being first, we might have been first in, but then we realized maybe we shouldn't have done this, or maybe we shouldn't have added this product, or maybe we went too quickly. So first is not always best. Uh, collaboration with the neighbors and the industry is critical, in my opinion. You know, these type of conversations we're having today, these networking events or networking things, when you learn from others, there's so much out there, especially at this time, that we can learn from each other and utilize that before you make any decisions, before you discuss with stakeholders. See what else is out there in the industry. How can you help change things? And what are lessons learned from those areas? Third one is the perfect solution is not always the best. You know, you very, I, it's, it's hard for engineers to say that, but from a theoretical perspective, you might have the perfect solution out there, but there's other factors involved. There's people's jobs that are at stake, at stake based on some of this. There's cost to customers at stake. There's state involvement, politics. We all know there's other factors. So sometimes getting a good solution might be OK versus the perfect solution because the perfect solution might not just be possible sometimes. And then to me, overcomplication of the rules is one of the biggest things. I think there are many rules within the PGM market that are just way overcomplicated and sometimes simplifying the rules, which piggybacks into having the perfect solution. You can simplify the rules and might not have the perfect solution. But in the long run, it might be a lot uh, easier. So th I think that's another key factor here. So other than that, I just have uh, just a slide about, you know, our continuing industry evolution. And this is obviously working, impacts all the RTOs, all the areas in the world uh, where we're looking for more intermittent resources. You know, many countries are already there. Or, 
uh, or pull on less um, less carbon type resources, low emission resources, alternative um, areas uh, for energy growth in, in different spots and developing of more technology uh, signals um, and, and things like that. And then my last slide, I promise, um, is the number of changes in the industry too. This piggybacks on the previous one where we are seeing a lot of different areas uh, from storage and renewables in the United States within PJM, change in fuel mix, uh, energy efficiency products, Cybersecurity is huge uh, within PJ, and we keep expanding our area in there. And then the behavior of customers, giving more customers, not only on the wholesale level and the retail level, more choices that impacts our market. So a lot in a short amount of time. Uh, it looks like I'm right at my time anyway, and I'm done with my slides here, but um, happy to take any input uh, or questions if there is time, Omer. Other than that, I can hang on and we can discuss later. But that's all I have to for today. Yeah, this is Taha here. Thank you, Mr. Tim, for the insightful overview of the PGM interconnection. Your presentation was eloquent and informative. Now we will take a 15 minutes quiz and uh, coffee break. I have shared the quiz in the Google Classroom for all the participants. Uh, the quiz will not take more than five minutes, so you can utilize the rest of the time to take a break. Well, thank you, Taha. Uh, Umar here, Tim. Excellent. Uh, thank you for your time. We have two presenters to go. So uh, all of uh, all participants, uh, we have uh, participation from all across the globe. Please stay tuned. There are very two interesting sessions coming up. One on the Spanish market and the other one is on Brazil. Uh, for the presenters, here's an important note that uh, the questions are coming. You can see uh, the questions on the chat box of Microsoft Teams. We are going to gather all the questions and list them and share them with you before the fourth presentation ends. Well, uh, thank you, everyone. We'll have a 15 minutes break. The quiz is in the Google Classroom. Take your time and uh, then you take some short break also and come back in 15 minutes. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Let's resume the session. I'm pleased to invite Mr. George to share the insights of the Spanish electricity market. Over to you, Mr. George. Sorry, uh, Mr. I George. was my, my macro mute. Uh, so, uh good morning good evening <laughs> good afternoon to all of you uh well, good evening even uh i is a very glad i'm very glad to have some minutes now to share with you the history and make a major characteristic of the spanish power market perhaps we have to call about the iberian power market because in portugal and spain it's a single market uh, since more than 50 years just now. Uh, and my presentation will be slightly different than the previous two ones. I do not want to show that all the particular characteristics of the market, but mainly how the environment, so that means the geography, the situation, the economy, the structure of the power system, etc constraints or the development of a market and how, why the market is tailored in one way and not in the other. Before starting, okay, I want to show you some basic characteristics of the Spanish power market uh, only to you understand the power sector. Look, this is the graph about the evolution of the demand in the last 23 years. It's clear that there are three different periods. We have a period for instance, since year 2000, we can say, and even before until 2008 approximately, in uh, which- uh, Mr. George, the, we cannot see your presentation. Can you share the screen? Oh, sorry. I suppose I have done it, but okay, wait a second and tell me if I'm- Yeah, now it's seeing visible. it now? Is visible? Okay. Yeah, Let yeah. Me, Okay. Sorry. Sorry for that. Uh, this is, a, as I said, the demand evolution over the last 25 years. Uh, three very different periods can be observed. We have a period that the graph started in the year 2000, but can be since the early 90s until 2008, approximately, where the demand was growing about 
little bit less than 4% per year. But during the last 10 years, or even a little bit more, the demand is declining at a, pay, at a rate of about minus 1% per year. Uh, after some years, that was more or less constant in the order of 260 terawatt hours. Just now, we are in the order of 220 terawatt hours per year. And why? Well, it's a combined effect of several reasons. Uh, a little bit can be uh, attributed to the uh, combined effect of energy efficiency and self generation. Uh, another, another reason is uh, okay, the, the, the economy was not developing as fast as expected. And okay, just now we are declining at a rate of about 2% per year, and we expect that this will continue. Because basically, even if the economy has recovered, the number of prosumers, that means people that are not in the market or outside the market, is growing. And this tendency will continue in the future. But say that, look at this, two, this, this graph. This is the installed capacity in the Spanish system. In the 2000, in 2000, year 2000, we have 50 gigawatt hours of installed capacity. Nowadays, we have 120 gigawatts of installed capacity. And the demand has not increased, as you said before, or increased slightly. We can see in this graph that in these 25 years, the demand grows from a little bit higher than 200 terawatt hours to 253 terawatt hours. That means it's not a huge amount of what the energy, but the stock capacity grew much more than the demand, much, much more than the demand. And the reason is not other than the uh, rapid development of wind and solar power in general renewables that was fostered by the government and by the most of the institutions during many years that has produced this big change in the shape of the say generation mix. Even more, if you look at the left figure, you see here about say 40% of coal and it's zero nowadays. Well, it's negligible, we can say. And so all this nuclear power is more or less the same as before, even a little bit lower. Hydro capacity is more or less the same. A lot of combined cycles were installed in the first part of the 90s, and a huge amount of solar and wind power. And finally, this is only for you, which are not familiar with uh, Spain, and this is the network, the transmission network of Spain, and you see it's a pretty mesh transmission network in 400 kV and 220 kV, which is different than in other countries like the United States that we hear just now, in which the distance are much more bigger and the transmission is more scarce. And also to complete this initial presentation, uh, this initial part, these are the fifth distribution companies that exist nowadays in Spain that have suffered over time some changes, but not much significant changes. And uh, the important thing is all these distribution companies in the past had also generation that were integrated companies. So with this part of the picture, let's see a little bit of history. And we need to start this very short history. Well, 30 years or more than 40 years ago, or even more years ago, because it's very important to understand how this has been configured. The history we can start it after World War II. At that moment, after the reconstruction of Europe, many countries, not all of them, but many, many European countries decided to nationalize their electricity sector. And at that moment, EDF was created in France, Enel was created in uh, Italy, uh, CGV was created in the UK, the same in Greece, the same in Germany. That means big national companies owned by the state. But Spain was never joining this tendency. Spain was 
created since the very beginning of the electrification until today by private companies that with time they merged and created larger companies, but always private companies that were never belong to the state. So in the latest part of uh, 1970, at uh, the beginning of 1980, uh, the situation for this private company was very problematic uh, for many reasons, mainly because the uh, the evaluation of the peseta, the national currency at that moment, uh, also because they have been involved in heavy uh, investments in nuclear power, and uh, with the inflation, they have loans in foreign currency that they cannot afford, and a lot of things. So, and also a, an important thing that was a change in government. It was in 1983, the Socialist Party was the first party, in fact, it was the second, but that uh, appeared in the scene after the democracy in, in Spain. And this party was a socialist idea. And they said at that moment that they probably will nationalize the power sector to solve the problems. But this didn't happen. Instead of that, in 1983 was created one figure, legal figure that was named uh, something like legal stable framework. Uh, this is an acronym in Spanish, M-R-E, that was an agreement between the government, the new established government, and the private sector to solve the problems of the power sector. And this was maintained more or less constant until 1997. Uh, which are the major characteristics of that? It was like a contract. This was never a contract, but it was an agreement between the private sector and the government uh, which says that the private companies will remain publicly owned, privately owned, having generation, transmission, and distribution. But in exchange, they allowed to create a new company, mainly state-owned, although today is only 30% owned by the government, which is the Red Electric of Spain, that uh, is the transmission company, and at the same time, the economic dispatch of the of the system uh, because they consider dispatch as a national responsibility. The first time they consider dispatch as a national responsibility rather than the previous scheme in which the companies traded bilaterally. And okay, a lot of other things that we not need to go in detail. Uh, but one thing what is important for the future is that they establish a national electric energy plan which says more or less that the future development will not be decided by the companies, but will be decided by the government. And there was some kind of beauty contest in the sense that the, the plan is decided by the government, but is implemented by the private companies. And at that moment, there was some kind of beauty contest. So the companies decide or bid or discuss where there should this development decided by the government should take place. And of course, in all this time with the heavy involvement of the companies by not one by one, by the an association that represented all of them. And the uniform tariff for the whole territory. But this is okay. This is a history until 1997. In 1997, there was the first change that started what we can call today the Spanish electricity market. At that moment, again, through a different change in the government, it was passed a law that completely changed the existing regime. What is, are these changes? Okay, allows competition in generation. As I said before, uh, the generation was, the decision of generation was decided by the government, just now, no, it's competition in generation. It established the open access to the transmission and distribution system, so newcomers can enter. They required accounting separation that later on was legal, but at that moment was only accounting between distribution, uh, generation, distribution, and supply. <coughs> uh, the generation is expansion is decided by the agents themselves, of course, subject to the general energy policy of the country. And at that moment, they created the wholesale market, which was constructed around the idea of an. Uh, energy only market or only energy market 
we establish also a capacity mechanism that we talked just now, and a gradual allowance of retail competition, and very important the establishment of a standard cost regime. We will concentrate in the last issues because these were particular of Spain and the reasons behind that. Well, the market was configured around a regulator that at the beginning, the regulator was the Ministry of Energy, although they created a commission with some powers, but not full powers, was not a full regulator, we can say. And this uh, was named the Electricity System National Commission. With time, they incorporated also gas and created the Energy National Commission. And later on, uh, 10 years ago, more or less 10 years ago, they created all these functions were transferred to the Market and Competition National Commission that includes electricity, gas, telecom, transport, etc., road transport and, and aviation. Uh, it was decided to create two operators. This is also different than other countries at that moment, just now it's more common, to have a market operator and a system operator. The market operator theoretically only should deal with economic issues. That means should not be involved in any technicality of the network or the, the system itself. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, the system operator was created around Red Electrica, the company I mentioned before, that was created in 83, that at that moment were doing the dispatch itself. And the market opens with to several agents, producers, that is the generators, self-producers also, distributors, retailers, and qualified customer. Qualified customer is the name we use in Spain for, or use it in Spain, for eligible customers. That means customer that can sign contracts, bilateral contracts with retailers. All the others are captive customers. Let's talk a little bit about this. The retail market. The retail market opens pretty rapidly. Uh, if you remember, the, the law was passed in 97, so we, this market started in January 1st, 1988, and at this moment, all very big customers were allowed to trade bilaterally. That means all customers around 15 gigawatt hours per year. Uh, one year later, this was reduced to five, four months later to three, five months later to two, and by the end of the year, all generators, uh, all the consumers about one gigawatt hour. And in 2000, July 2000, that means two years after the opening of the market, to all medium voltage consumers. And in, 19, uh, in 2003, that means five years after opening of the market or the creation of the market, all consumers were considered eligible. And this is a graph, more or less, showing the percentage of the demand that was gradually open. At the very beginning, only 30%, that means the very, very big companies. Two years later, was something like 60% of the demand. And in 2002, was 70, 70 something percent of the demand. The rest in 2003, which is basically the domestic consumers. At that moment was established a regime for capacity payments that should be read side by side with a stranded cost that will come in just now. Uh, it was decided that the market will not provide all the revenues required for all the power generators to remain in the system. So some kind of capacity payments, they should be allowed to receive some kind of capacity payment. After many discussions, again, as in many, many things that happened during this period, a very pragmatic approach was used. What is this pragmatic approach? It says, okay, the demand will pay an amount of a uh, certain amount that was decided. Uh, that means 7.8 euros per megawatt hour. This was expressed in, in, in pesetas at that moment. And the amount that is collected is distributed among available generators. Uh, not with some more detailed procedures, but uh, the generators were paid uh, in some hours. But at the end, all of them knew in advance they have a revenue stream as capacity payments. 
And as I said before, this is a cost that is paid by the demand, full stop, or by all the demand. Later on, only by the regulated demand. That means consumers that were not signing bilateral contracts. This is a very important thing that happened at that moment that we need to understand in, uh, in the light of what I said before. The uh, private companies had some rights, acquired rights. What were these acquired rights? Okay, the agreement that was signed with the government in 1983, that the government promised them to maintain a stream of revenues if they are making the investments that the government decides. But nobody assures if this will happen in the market. And so some kind of agreement was reached with the private sector. It was an agreement that was never officially published, you can say, but was an agreement understood by everybody. They say, okay, you should compensate me for the investments I have done, because you told me that I have to make such, such investments. Uh, this is a principle in the economy or in the macroeconomy that is the uh, legitimate confidence. That means private people are making investments, assuming that the rules of the game will not be changed when you have done the investments. Uh, so how much should be this stranded cost? It's not exactly stranded cost. Where the cost, the difference between the revenue stream that the companies would expect to receive in the market and the revenue streams that they supposedly be allowed to receive is the, the regime is not changed. So after some simulations, uh, it was decided that a total amount, a fixed total amount of $12 billion will be recovered by the existing generation companies. Uh, but not as a fixed payment. The procedure was a little bit complicated, but the, the idea of the, the issue is, okay, we do not know how the market prices will be, but we will assume that is 36 pesetas, uh, three, sorry, 36 euros, per, yeah. <laughs> per megawatt hour. So if you receive from the market 36 euros per megawatt hour in average, this value for each of the companies, you will be entitled to receive the difference if you not reach this 36. If it's above this 36, uh, okay, you keep the money, but the difference is deducted from this global amount of 12 billion. Uh, and uh, this amount was used in the determination of the tariffs. So it means that the cost was transferred to the tariffs, all customers. Take a look at this graph, which says the average pool price during this, this, this day. The, the price was practically constant around 34, 35, 36, etc until 2004. <laughs> that means during seven years, the price discovered in the market <laughs> by chance was equal, it's not by chance, of course, uh, was equal to the uh, this value of 36 euros. And this is because the companies more or less bid strategically. Uh, that means they say, okay, if I uh, bid a higher price, okay, at the end, the amount that I receive extra, will be deducted from this this total amount. So uh, there was no uh, collusion. There was no collusion or agreements or nothing else. Only the rules pushed them to be around these 36 euros per megawatt hour. But the situation changes, like you can see, dramatically in 2005, 6, 7, and later on. What happens there? Well, uh, not everybody agreed with this idea of the stranded costs and the companies receiving this money. It was huge opposition from other politicians, from the media, whatever. And uh, so uh, even it happened, uh, it, there was opposition, an important opposition. In fact, the national regulator published it in the newspapers why it was against this matter this matter. 
and uh, saying that, okay, the government has decided that, but I have to say that this is not the correct way, blah, blah, blah. So they start creating doubts in the companies about how the future will look like. If there is opposition grows, the government changes or whatever, they can change that. Also, some companies, not all the companies have the same percentage of this uh, 12 billion. Uh, some of them recover more than the others. And some of them, after five years, they have recovered a significant portion of that. Uh, and also due to the change of the technologies, of the prices of the equipment and so on, and the fuels, of course, this 36 ceased to be a reference, a, a good benchmark. So the result was that uh, the system, this, say, stranded cost regimes start to have modifications. The first one after three years, where they reduce it, the total amount due to the opposition, as I said before, and instead of 12, it was 866 billion plus 177. But this 177 only allocated to coal power plants because at that moment there was a policy for coal in Spain. And so it was an important change. So this created also reluctances about the stability of this regime. And at the end, after three years of not receiving compensation because the market price, you see this previous slide, uh, in 2005, 2006, the price was well above the 36, 62, 65. In 2007, uh, at the end of 2006, but in fact, in 2007, the system was abandoned. Uh, there was a law that says, okay, the company has recovered what they have to recover in the interest of the of the system, this was eliminated and the law was changed to explicitly say that this doesn't exist anymore. And the companies accepted that, of course. Uh, this is important to see how the degrees of freedom in uh, deciding what to do with the market uh, is important. Uh, this hasn't happened in the UK, for example. Why this happened in the UK? Because the UK was a national system. They privatize it with the new rules, that's all. The same happened in, in Latin America. Oh, sorry, sorry, give me one second. And the same happened in uh, other European countries. But Spain has this particularity. Between 2006 and 2008, a lot of things happens. First, the abolition of the city, the cost of transition to the competition, the creation of the Iberian market, joining Portugal and Spain under a single market, uh, some obligations of the two major companies to sell not assets, but virtual power plants. That means we are forced to auction some energy to permit the, the, the discourse to, to move. Uh, and uh, Okay, several other measures that you can see in the in the screens in the following screens. Uh, the second thing that happened that created uh, a significant important thing was the renewables energy boom. What happens between 2007 and 2012? A lot of renewable power was incorporated into the system, and this power. Uh, in most of the cases, uh, uh, came under the feed-in tariff regime. That means outside the market. Uh, to have some figures, for example, between uh, uh, five years or six years, the install capacity grew from 11,000 megawatts to 28,000 megawatts in only uh, six years. <laughs> um, and so, well, uh, this created a problem that we do not need to enter in detail because uh, of the tariff problem. So at the end in 2012, uh, the change uh, there was a full, complete change of this uh, regime for any wars. We can go very, very quickly to this wholesale electricity market uh, because it's more or less typical than any other market. 
except for the fact that it's organized under two different entities, a market operator and a system operator, and with several problems in the frontier. Uh, of course, there always existed uh, bilateral contracts market over the over uh, over the counter, or contracts for differences or whatever. And when uh, Portugal and Spain merged their markets, it was decided that the wholesale market was run by Spain, and the derivatives market will be run uh, had been run is is being run by Portugal. The daily markets, the day ahead market, intraday market, very typical, and some balancing mechanisms for uh, real time operations. Uh, this is the sequence of these daily markets. Typical day ahead market, then some uh, blue means market operator, uh, orange means uh, system operator. Uh, okay, solving the technical restrictions. Uh, we need to think that this happens in 98 or 2000, where the tools, IT tools, were not so powerful as today. Then, when this is solved and the uh, dispatch was created, a different market was run, which is the ancillary service market. And this ends with instructions to generators. And when this finished, immediately after, I uh, open, open it an intraday market. And the same sequence is repeated for each of the intraday market. Here you can see the times that were valid at that moment. The day ahead market was a typical marginal market with the only characteristic that they have simple offers and they allow complex offers. Complex offers means I give you an offer uh, with pieces, but you have to accept it completely or not. Or uh, I have to obtain a minimum income, if not retire my offer some risk of ramping, but some say IT complications, but say typical. This is a solution of technical constraint, which is more or less typical. And this is the ancillary service market, which is at this, at this moment was one of the first market that was created. That means mainly secondary reserve was created around the market and a separate market. That means a market that opens at the moment the day ahead market closes, we can say. Uh, and this is still up today. And then we created a third market, which called the, uh, the tertiary reserve market, which is a more simplified market with offers that last forever, or that means until you change it. And this was used by the system operator to equilibrate the system when the deviations created in the secondary reserve was not enough to, to recover the system. Uh, and the intraday market, okay, I suppose most of you know, it's something like a day ahead market, but in this case, voluntary market. Uh, the deviations market is something like today is the balancing market. Uh, was not having this, na this the name of balancing market at that moment, was considered the deviation market. I was run by the system operator in a short notice that to purchase more generator or uh, decrease generator generation in case of incidents that goes beyond the normal ones. Uh, okay, and here you can have the sequence of the markets that we can skip it because it's normal. What happens later on? Uh, okay, this was never, so I never had a mandatory pool, but was almost, uh, yes, uh, uh, was practically mandatory at the very beginning due to the rules that existed. But with time, companies started to create, to sign bilateral contracts and gradually it transformed de facto in a net pool. Today, it's a de facto net pool scheme in Spain, whatever. Uh, we can skip all this because it's less common. I, I want to show four or five slides more. Sorry for the running. Uh, Spain is in Europe, <laughs> it's important. So what happens in Europe influences a lot what happens in Spain. So during the last 30 years, the European Commission was pushing for uh, creating a single market, but each country has decided its own rules. And in many countries, the pools, the power exchanges were not mandatory, were run I cannot say fully unregulated, but almost unregulated. That means absolutely voluntary. And there was a lot of companies doing that. 
and all of them working at the national level. So what it was done? Okay, we can you can see here a lot of moments in which the European Commission forced it gradually to create more, more, and more uh, single markets across Europe. So the, what I wanted to comment you is that we can skip to here. How because this is very unique. Say so how do you develop a day ahead market with a lot of power pools that are not forced to work unified? How do you manage that? And this was done through an algorithm which was called Euphemia, that was decided by four market operators, important one, one of them was the Spanish one or the Spanish Portuguese one. And this is an algorithm in which all the power pools, so not pools, sorry, the power exchanges across Europe that adheres to that work together. They unified the time for closing the, the bids. And if you bid in the Spanish market, automatically your bid is put in all across Europe. And the, this algorithm of FEMIA is the algorithm that has certain characteristics that optimizes, we can say optimizes the whole, this full dispatch. But the important thing is there is no single market operator in Europe. Are something like 12 or 14 just nowadays, each of one independent, each one working with its national rules, but all of them coordinated together. And this, you can see, this is a map of of Europe, of the different zones that are coupled in this euphemia algorithm. In yellow here, you see Spain and Portugal at the, the end of that. But all this was a really, really big advance in Europe in order to create a single market without a single market operator and without a single system operator. This is uh, very, very important and is somehow unique because uh, it's not like the regional ports in other places of the world, or it's not like the PGM we uh, here just now. You see PGM covers a lot of regions in Europe, or in India, covers a lot of regions in India, but it's a single operator. And here in Europe, you have, I do not know the exact number, I think are 14, but something like that. 14 market operators working together, um, a single bid put in Spain is valid in Estonia or in Greece. This more or less created a single market, but the transmission constraints are still there. And you see the prices are not unique. These are the average prices last year in 2023, and you see zones with 40 euros per megawatt hour, some with 80, and some with 90, and even 100 euros per megawatt. Why? Because the transmission constraints. And uh, one day, Europe has the single price. This was in at, at midnight of uh, December 5th, and in uh, October 99th was the moment of highest dispersion. So to end this presentation, what happens next? What are the challenges of this European or Iberian market? The most important thing by far is the penetration of renewables that creates high volatility of marginal prices. You see these graphs. In six days, in one month, you see prices of over 250 euros followed by prices of zero. Of course, volatility of the, the day ahead market is, a, is an intrinsic characteristic, but this high volatility is impressive. And why is this? Because renewable energy. You see, here you have seven consecutive days of zero price, practically zero price. And this uh, creates a problem. You see, these are two consecutive days. One day with prices in the order of 180 euros per megawatt hour, following by the day of zero <laughs> during five hours. And, and this is a problem because it reduces the revenues of conventional plants, but you need these conventional plants to, to maintain reliability. Uh, how to solve that? Some people say these batteries. Batteries could be the, what is needed to support the growth in renewables. But today, batteries are still expensive. So, but perhaps it's the solution. But this is creating a big concern that nowadays 
and also prosumers. The demand is going down and prosumers are increasing. So uh, all this is a cocktail that requires some changes. Which are the changes? Depending who you ask. There is no common solution. It's not totally clear, but there's a general consensus that some kind of capacity payments are needed. Uh, that means, this is from my point of view, the time of the energy only market is finished or is finishing. Uh, all the theorists, guys, scholars, and what that pushes for the, that the energy only market will provide all the signals that the economy requires to develop proves not to be true. Uh, and just now there is a general consensus about some capacity payments or alternative ways of doing that, like for example, long-term contracts or similar are needed, but no agreement about how to do that. Uh, my personal opinion is the next future, say five, next four, five, six years will be characterized by patches to the existing system. That means trying to preserve the particularities of the marginal prices in the economy and the power sector. And later on, you will see, or we will see if I continue working, no receipt yet. Uh, everybody is concerned, and I cannot imagine a power sector living in Europe at least 10 years more with this kind of volatility that is preventing a lot of investments, especially investments in uh, conventional generation that are, that is needed. So sorry for exceeding my time and uh, thank you. And I'm at your disposition if you want to discuss with more details any of the points that I have skipped because they, they reduce the time for this presentation. Hope this may help you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. George, for the detailed presentation on the Spanish electricity markets. Now I am pleased to invite Mr. Ricardo to provide us with an overview of the Brazilian electricity market. Over to you, Mr. Ricardo. Thank you very much. Salam Aleikum. Can you see my PowerPoint presentation? Yeah, we can. it's visible. OK, so let's start then. May I start? Yeah. So um, good afternoon for you all. My name is Salam Aleikum. My name is Ricardo Perez. Uh, I've been working at PSR since 2009. We are a, a software development and a worldwide consulting company located in Brazil. I was in Pakistan to train uh, to, to provide a production costing and expansion planning training for you guys in CPPA. I'm very happy to see some names I know. So I'm gl very glad to be here again. It's an honor for me. OK, and today I'm going to talk about the overview of the Brazilian power market. Right. And this is very interesting because we show two perspectives of Europe and US. They, they are looking at the zero marginal cost system. But Brazil started with hydro plants 40, 50, 60 years ago. Right. So we know how to handle this problem of uncertainty and not having a direct operating cost of a thermal plant in the system. Right. So we're going to show to you another perspective, uh, very different from what you've seen. So I think it will be complementary to the presentations we are seeing today, right? Before we do so, let me give a quick glance on what PSR, our company, does. We have main three branches, analytics, consulting, and ESG decarbonization. In the analytics, where we develop our software, so production costing simulation, short term, long term expansion planning tools, these are the main tools, and also portfolio optimization and ma maximization of revenues for clients. We do also have a consulting field where we do expansion planning, price forecasting, market design, arbitrage, and many others, right? And we do have also the decarbonization area. Well, we have more than 6,000 citations, scientific. Our presence is more than 70 countries in all continents. We have more than 1,500 license sold, and we have 98% license renewal. This for us is the most important number because we do say that what we provide is a solution that involves software and people, right? So we think our support service is as vital as our product, right? So uh, the attention to the client is vital. And just to point out, the models that we commercialize, the main models, we have the short-term tool, 
which is used officially by many ISOs to day ahead, to applying day ahead dispatch schedule, week ahead, real-time redispatch. It's integrated with SCADA system, and it's also have a 5, 15, 30, one hour resolution of dispatch. We have the long-term tool. The beauty of this tool is the stochastic modeling approach, uh, handling uncertainties and storage, which is the key for the renewable penetration and at zero systems. And we do also have the capacity expansion planning tool. These are the commercialized tools. Below, we have auxiliary free tools, renewable modeling, maintenance schedule, reliability, cloud solution, BI tool, and an API to interconnect our solution with others, right? So just a quick glance on what we do. And now let's jump into the Brazilian system, right? So uh, the Brazilian systems back in the days, in the 80s and 90s, we were mainly predominantly hydros and we got a lot, of, a little bit of thermal, right? Uh, so here, when we see in the evolution of the system, we see hydros, and then we see coal, oil, natural gas, nuclear, biomass, wind, solar, and DG, right? Distributed generation. But before we dive deeper into that, one important thing that happened to us was our rationing. So in 2001, we got a very important rationing was a consequence of a combination of inadequate supply expansion and also a severe drought, right? This was very expansion because it, as Tim said, the discussion between agents, regulatory framework, regulatory agency, ISO, all this discussion, PSR was very active at this moment. We needed to find solutions. So we started to design auctions. So Brazil, uh, started to design auctions to develop long-term contracts to hire this energy, right? Uh, and then the consequence was the diversification of our matrix with thermal hedge against future droughts, right? And then we started evolving in 2009. We got the first renewable auction, right? And then we got wind and then solar, and now we have 30 gigawatt of distributed generation. So distributed generation is playing a big role in the Brazilian system today, right? And then we can think, okay, as Omer said very nicely at the beginning of the session, we have mainly uh, bid-based dispatch systems and we have also cost-based dispatch system. But as we said in the production costing training, hydro plants don't have a direct operating cost. Instead, they have an indirect cost associated with the opportunity of displacing a thermal resource today or in the future. It has an opportunity cost, but how can we handle it? So the approach Brazil said in terms of said to develop that was let, let's do a regulated market with long-term PPAs and also in the price formation, let's do a centralized dispatch with a cost-based dispatch system. So we advance it this way. So our power plants are centrally dispatched by the ISO using a suite of computational models whose objective is to minimize system operating cost. And it's the expected value of it since we have many scenarios. We have scenarios, very wet scenarios. We have dry scenarios. We have more or less scenarios. We have windy scenarios. We have not so. So it's a stochastic approach. Deterministic, forget it. It's stochastic. Seeing the uncertainty, seeing what the system will face in the future, right? The spot prices are a byproduct of the dispatch algorithms. They are, they are a result of the software, right? And they are the load marginal cost. After we find the load marginal cost, a regulatory cap and floor is applied to these prices, right? Um, well, and then how could we make a simulation of this, of this forecasting prices in the future? Well, we pick up the macro, macroeconomic variables, inflation, GDP, fuel prices, energy demand, thermal heat rates, and so on. We feed the production costing software with inflows also, and also with renewable scenarios, right? We also have renewable scenarios here, hydro inflows, macroeconomic scenarios. We run the dispatch simulation stochastically with many scenarios, and we get storage trajectories, we get deficit risks, we get spot prices, we get expectation of generation for each plant in each scenario. So in Brazil, we run with 1,200 scenarios. So for each scenario, we will have 
when expected generation for each plant in the system in each scenario, right? We do also have, the, as a result, the spillage of hydro plants and also renewable curtailment. PSR is very active in, for example, being hired by renewable plants to see where it's being it's connected to do long term runs and see how much of renewable energy will be curtailed in the system due to bottlenecks congestions. And this affects the alcoy. The more spillage, the greater the alcoy, the more expensive is the project, the worse is the project. So forecasting the renewable curtailment is as vital as uh, anything while assessing a new project, right? So the, in, we talked about the price formation. Now let's talk about the Brazilian power market structure, right? We, uh, our market structure in two major markets. One is the PPA one and the other is the spot one, right? In the PPA, we have the regulated market used exclusively by discos. So discos must go to an auction, set, fix a PPA, sign a PPA to higher energy. So it must forecast its demand growth, see the amount it needs to hire, go to the auction and buy energy in the auction. This is how our, our regulated market works, right? And we have a free market in which end consumers are free to negotiate their own PPAs with generators or traders, and the prices are negotiated bilaterally, right? So they are free to go there here. So here is how it's called our ACR, our regulated market, and our free market. This is how it works. We have also a commission, uh, energy trading chamber, right? So the spot market, it will, so the surpluses and the shortfalls of energy, with respect to the contracted volumes are settled and cleared uh, at the spot price uh, and be, this is managed by our chamber, right? This is how our system works. But now, since you are interested and it's very curious about the Brazilian experience on auctions, we are reference on auctions. Uh, we, we, PSR was one of the main contributors for the government in Brazil after the rationing to design the auctions. And now we are consultant in many countries in the world due to the auctions being needed for the the peak the supply and capacity auctions etc so let's have a quick overview about our history on auctions right in 2005 we started our new uh, we call new energy for uh, buying new energy right for new plants so we started in 2005 and the expansion was driven mainly by hydro and thermals and in that case, it was oil, right? And a few coal and natural gas. It was very few. Then we started the wind debut, the first wind auction, right? Now we have also more or less 28 gigawatt installed. And then in 2014, we got our solar debut. And also the LNG business model appeared as an alternative to integrate to vertically integrated gas producers. In 2017, uh, we had our first winner using natural gas project from the pre-salt oil fields. You may know it. It's, it's, it became very famous, our pre-salt um, fields. Uh, then we got in 2021, we started to have what Europe is facing and US uh, faced in PJM some years ago too, the peak problem. So we also developed our first capacity reserve auction right in 2001. Uh, and the problem was flexibility. Basically, our hydros were with low levels. Uh, we didn't have a much inflows at uh, this year. And then what happened is that we had peak problems and then we designed it uh, 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 off a uh, capacity auction, right? And then in 2002, I think it's a very important year also because it was when it happened, the privatization of Electrobras. So Electrobras, our system started, Electrobras is our very huge public pay player as CPPA, and in 2021, we decided to privatize our in our company, right? So nowadays, uh, it was the great majority was public, and after the privatization, now uh, it's private, right? So in the here, if we look at the auctions, here we can see in the X, in this left axis, the volume sold uh, in megawatt average, in the right axis, in the dashed curve, the average price of the auction, right? So we may see that we start in blue hydro thermal, and then we evoluted here 
adding wind and solar, right? Uh, here, what is important is that we had a price rise here due to the economic conditions worsen. Basically, the exchange rate to dollars increased too much, and we had higher interest rates for the project. So the prices of the auctions increased it very much. Another important thing that we can, a key takeaway of this graph is the severe economic downturn we had in Brazil, which affected also the demand growth, the GDP growth, and also our hiring and our contracting truth auctions, correct? That's it. That's the mainly key, take, key takeaways from here. Uh, the, the slides will be available for you to dive deeper into these numbers if you want. So I want to summarize this first part in some key takeaways, right? So you have asked me the question, uh, what factors lead towards the origination of the market? And I would say that uh, as the expansion was based on large scale structuring projects, predominantly high, huge hydro projects, far away from load centers, right? They are far away and have uncertainty on the productions based on the inflows. So with the aiming of attracting investors and having rev revenue predictability, our expansion began based on auctions, right? With long-term contracts, right? Nowadays, the market concentration is relatively mild. Uh, our top 10 players uh, own 43% of the installed capacity. Right? And we have federal, stated on it, and private companies. Um, the co Electrobras is a huge holding, right? Inside Electrobras, the companies that are there produce more than 60% of the energy of Brazil. And this happened, the privatization, as I said, it was very important for our system, right? So another very key question you asked me, and I really like it, it's for me to structure how I could answer it, was how did Brazil, uh, the Brazilian market pave the way for the integration of renewables? Well, it started with policy-driven subsidies, right? So it was a support mechanism designed for renewables. In 2002, we created a specific program for that of hiring 3.3 gigawatt of renewable through a 20-year PPA called ProInfa, right? At this time, this ProInfa was divided in three equal quotas one-third wind, one-third small hydro, one-third biomass, right? And the cost of these contracts was collected through a system charge that was paid by all consumers, regulated and free, proportional to their corresponding annual energy consumption. So look that this was very important for us because it was vital for what? For the industry settlement in Brazil. And so that the industry could come come here, start building the wind turbines in Brazil, right? And therefore, we got economic scale of gain, economic scale gain to, to enhance the technology, to have in technology improvements to reduce the costs in the future, right? And also, we had 50% we had discount on the open access transmission tariff. So basically, the renewables with with less than 30 megawatt, right? And also free consumers that buys energy from a free consumer that buys energy from the renewables had 50% discount on the tariff. The tariff is a huge cost for the private owner. So it was a, a nice subsidy and it was very important for this auction, for this program success. And the ProInfa was re replaced by renewable auctions in 2007 and eight. Mainly because, okay, now the industry is consolidated, we are good to go, we could uh, start that. This is very important to see that policy subsidies uh, subsidies are important to, for the industry settlement. But if you do it long term, you create distortions in the market. So it must start and end, uh, and these timings are very vital, right? So... Uh, if we look at our renewable in Brazil, uh, basically, first, if we look at the IRENA, levelized cost uh, curves, uh, LCOI curves uh, here, and we look at the average prices in the right of the Brazilian renewable auctions in USD, you can see they're, they are very close, right? So they are pretty good. Uh, here also remembering it's just because of the interest rates rise due to the dollar prices gaining up, right? 
But at the end of the day, our competitive market of renewables is very robust, is very nice. They don't need subsidies anymore. Uh, and we are competitive. Th that's it, right? Basically, uh, the wind and solar expansion is driven by technological improvements, as I said. Ah, this is also very important. We have national development banks that provide nice, favorable financial conditions, interest rates that are that are better than in the market. This also help uh, help it a lot our our renewable expansion. And we have subsidies in the tariffs, transmission tariffs, right? So if we have a quick overview about business in generation here in Brazil, we can see that we have we can have uh, we can hire energy in auctions by the discos regulated market, we have free market, we have DG, distributed generation, and we have also self-production, either a prosumer or either a, a con bilateral contract between a consumer and a generator. In a special term, uh, without, the, without needing to pay system charges. Basically, it's a specific arrangement where you save money without paying system charges. And if we look at the top 10 companies in Brazil, the great majority now is private. But look that these plants here are like, this was, they were part, this company, sorry, they were part of the holding of Eletrobras. So look that the privatization of Eletrobras changed the whole uh, thing of the Brazilian system. We were mainly, the, more than 50 was public and now more than 50 is private, right? Let's shift now, let's shift to transmission. We need in Brazil, since we have a very big countries and we have many different hydro basins spread out the entire country, having different hydro regimes. So sometimes in the south, we have a huge amount of water. In the southeast, not so much. In the northeast, a lot. So we have many different hydro patterns and these, we have many different flow distributions all over the year, right? So we need a very robust transmission system to accommodate these different flows among the year. We do also this transmission is very important because now uh, this is another important message. How did Brazil design our market here? We said, okay, for the transmission, let's create a, a public centralized agency this agency will plan the expansion of transmission. This expansion plan, transmission expansion plan, will be determinative and we will auction the operation of these assets. So basically in Brazil, uh, the operation of the transmission are, uh, but they go to the auction to win and get a, 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 a transmission asset and operate it. And they get a revenue of operating these, 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 these plants, right? So if we look at the auctions, Basically, we start with a given price and then the bids are discounting the price. And if we look at the discounts here, we are reaching 40, 45 percent of discount in our auctions, right? In our transmission auctions, right? This is the key message here. So again, transmission, we have centralized planning. We try to do a proactive transmission planning for renewables. So we look at the hotspots of renewables and then we make the transmission get there so that when the when the renewables are built or win the auction they have transmission to 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 tra to tra transmit their 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 energy right so we this is also very important for us but okay we have a centralized transmission planning auction and we auction the operation of them okay moving to the distribution world so we have 53 distribution concessions. Basically, it's a public service performed upon a federal public concessions. Uh, and this is a key message here. The service compri comprises uh, of network usage, so wire plus energy, right? So in their tariff that the end consumer pays, there is energy and wire and system charges, right? Uh, we have uh, 90 million consumers we have um, 75 uh, total energy loss, so it's big, 89%. We have 64 regulated clients, like captive market, and 36 are in the free market, right? Uh, and this is also important to, to take a look, how was the evolution and the shares that were in the regulated market and in the 
free market among time. So let's take a deeper look on that, right? So again, recapping, our regulated mark are exclusively for discos. They have standard PPAs, long-term ones, and the trading happens through auctions, right? And we do also have the free market, free consumers, traders, bilateral PPAs are traded over the counter uh, and their PPAs, of course, are shorter, right? Three, four, up to six years. And if we look at the shares, we can see that in 2002, 97% was regulated. And among time, we increased the share on the free market, right? What happened? How did it happen, right? This is an important key message here. How, how, so since our consumers started to have the obligation to acquire energy through an auction, he was, he was needing to buy energy from the disco that is above him. How did we develop our free market? This is the key question here, right? So the Brazilian power sector is moving to full liberalization. We have a competitive generation segment in auctions, in free market, we have a transmission, and then we got to the retail service. So now we started, we started uh, like with paces, right? We started with large consumers. We opened the free market for them to buy energy from energy traders. And then we started moving for uh, medium consumers and so on until we reached the small consumers. So nowadays, small consumers are ob still obligated to buy from discos. So how does that happen, right? Let's take a deeper look on that. So since 2017, we are discussing a full market liberalization. But how did we do? Our, we have high voltage consumers and low voltage consumers. In the, in the high voltage consumers, we started simple. We started with, well, consumers with the load above three megawatt can acquire energy from the free market. Then we reduced a little bit the boundary. 2.5 in 2009, and then two, and then so on and so forth. 2023, above 500 k kilowatt, kilo kilowatts, and then uh, here we got the all consumers of how high voltage was in January this year, right? But still, as I said, low voltage consumers are obligated to acquire energy in in by the discos, right? Um, this is how we are nowadays. Right. And 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 then, OK, Ricardo, so medium consumers uh, are already like industries and uh, great, great, huge bakeries and so on are already being able to buy energy in the free market. So why is that happening? Are they moving? We saw they are moving. Why they are moving? So uh, if we look in blue, our short term PPA prices. If we look in red, we have the long-term PPAs. And if we look in green, we have the regulated energy cost. And we can see here that uh, we are moving to, we are here in a situation where the regulated cost is much higher than the short-term PPA. So we are having, we are in a big opportunity now in a, in a time where it makes sense to move, right? So the free market PPAs are currently cheaper than what local utilities are charging. And this is also a tricky part because why the regulated cost is expensive? Because the discos must acquire energy in auctions and they sign it long-term contracts. We call this the legacy contracts, right? So, uh, okay, we have clients moving to the free market, but the, the disco still needs to forecast its demand and also buy energy in the market and it stays with long-term PPAs in its portfolio. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem, right? So how can we handle this, right? Well, then let's answer the question, what are challenges and bottlenecks are we encountering during this transition to the full, full liberalization? Well, as you saw, our free market is still a maturing market. The transactions are over the counter still. So we have an unorganized free market. We have too much information asymmetry. We have low liquidity. We have few financial products offered in this market, right? And then one of the proposals is, is a fundamental measure for that is to create an exchange where 
where the negotiations could be carried out. So in that we would have a credible price reference, greater liquidity, uh, creation of new projects, products and central counterpike. So at the end of the day, the auctions worked for a pretty long time and helped our expansion with these huge hydro floor projects. But we are not being able to build more dams, right? So huge hydro dams are complicated to build, environmentally speaking. So we need to move into renewables, prosumers, and so on. We need to change our market, right? And another very important thing to recognize and avoid is what we call the death spiral. What is that? Well, we have attractive distributed generation. This attractive distributed generation provides the reduction of the consumer base of the disco because it moves to, uh, the demand grow, comes lower, some move to the free market. Then we have a greater tariff for the regulated clients that are still there in the disco portfolio. But then DGs with time becomes more attractive. And then we reduce again the consumer base. And then the tariff increases again. And then we more have prosumers, more active consumers. And then more active free market. And then DG increases again. And then who pays the bill? Who pays the bill? We're having discos with many clients moving to the free market, DG penetration and the legacy contracts are still in the discos. How can we handle this situation, right? So one of the proposals is to create a sector charge to split the legacy costs between all consumers of the systems, free and regulated. Note, note that in this case, each consumer will earn a charge, but will also gain their correspondent share of energy with respect to this split, right? And look at the natural consequence of that. Before we look at the natural consequence, let's remind that the cost paid by the regulated consumers, it has the energy tariff, energy purchase, energy losses in transmission sector charges, plus wire, let's say, transmission cost, distribution cost, and so on, right? So the natural conse consequence of the process we're talking here is the need to change the role of the discos in Brazil so that they are no longer responsible for higher energy at auctions. They have only the wire function. So this is the key message of this one of the proposals we are looking at to solve this puzzle we are facing in Brazil, right? So this is at the point we are now, we are reaching a full liberalization, but our free market still maturing. Uh, our, our auctions are very mature, they work pretty well, but uh, our free market is evolving and we need to adapt the system to, to that. So, Shukriya, thank you very much for your time today. I hope I could give you a glance about how our power market works and I'm free to answer questions. Well, thank you very much, Ricardo, for our excellent presentation. It was really enlightening. Uh, as always, you have uh, a lot of energy. You just run like a base load nuclear plant, which can be ramped up and down very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks a lot. So uh, with this, uh, because it's uh, about three hours now, so we will have like a short Q&A session. We have shortlisted about six questions from, from the chat box, uh, and my friend will put it on the screen. So Taha, if you can please put those questions on the screen. So I hope this the screen is visible, Ricardo, to you and everybody. So can I request the presenters to please, uh, if they can switch on their cameras. So there are six questions and first two questions are related to Indian market. So we have uh, uh, Dhuruv with us. So uh, the first question is with respect to levying of the stranded cost of the generation assets. So what I understand from the participant is that uh, you had 25 years long-term contracts and maybe you know in, in long-term contracts you have capacity which is more of take or pay so when the market got introduced open access was given so what were like in different states or was there a common kind of a methodology given by CERC centrally or the, uh, did the state regulators gave a formula behind it so drew over to so you for far. the first question uh, thanks, Omar. I, I guess the question was uh, with respect to the interconnection uh, charges of the grid. 
So uh, who is responsible for financing the cost for interconnection? Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I, was... I, I, I tried to read in between. So I'll, I'll just give you a, a broader uh, perspective on, on that particular thing. So what happens is, so uh, typically a transmission utility is uh, somewhat like uh, Power Grid Corporation of India uh, has, has, has an extensive role in overseeing the grid infrastructure management. And uh, they may assume some portion of this interconnection cost. However, uh, these expenses are typically recovered through tariffs uh, and uh, uh, charges which are levied on all the market uh, participants. So basically uh, socializing it. And uh, the, the next question is towards uh, why Indian electricity market is moving away from frequency-based division settlement mechanism. So there, there has been a long-standing debate specifically uh, with respect to the frequency, uh, uh, linking the deviation to the frequency. Uh, so the country has uh, used the ABT or the frequency-based mechanism since 2002 up till 2022. And uh, uh, so there was a need uh, to, to trigger basically uh, any deviation. So uh, with respect to the frequency, there was still some deviation which was happening in the, in the market, whether it was positively impacting the frequency or not. So since the frequency band has been reduced, so now the deviation uh, ideally should, should be uh, limited to the zero or, or, or the minimum number. So how that can be achieved is uh, basically uh, delinking it from the frequency and linking it, uh, we, are, we are directly to the higher of any, th any of those three uh, uh, parameters, which is day head market, real time market, and the ancillary services market and essentially uh, ancillary service market would only be run when there is uh, typically uh, the, the last drop of megawatt is not available from the existing uh, energy only market. And, and, and these uh, ancillary services typically at a very high prices. So currently uh, like, like the gas based generator uh, would, would be able to kind of come into the picture. So this high prices would be a deterrent for all the market participants to deviate from their existing schedule. Okay, thank you so much, uh, yeah, yeah. Dhruv, for for the elaborating. Uh, we will uh, participants will put the response of these questions also in writing, so that you can look at them later on on the website of Apex and CBPA. So the third question is uh, for Tim. This is about USPGM. So the question actually is that how the LMPs are locational marginal prices are calculated, and how they are recovered from the consumers and compensated to generators. So let, let me elaborate this. You tried to answer this also, but in several markets, uh, the LMPs are not charged directly to the consumers. They are restricted to the zones and the average is then charged to the consumer end. So this is coming from that background. So can you please elaborate uh, about PGM, the how it is working and what were the challenges in charging sure. LMPs to different consumers? Sure. So from the PGM market, we do a nodal thing. So every specific generator will have a nodal price, but we do settle the the load side of it or the demand side on a zonal basis for the most part. So we'll have transmission zones where it's settled at. So when we're calculating the LMP price, it's purely based on the, the bids that come into the market. So we'll have um, all the generators submit their bids into the market. The uh, demand side are pretty much price takers. They're just submitting the megawatt amount that will be need to clear in the market. So based on all the generator bids uh, in a non-constrained atmosphere, basically you will have to stack the bids up until you get to the marginal unit to meet the demand that's bid in from the uh, demand side of the house. And then you get a marginal clearing price and that marginal clearing price will be paid all the generation regardless of what you're bid at if you're clearing megawatt will be paid at that marginal lmp and the zones will pay the uh marginal that price for that generation and all the zones will pay that price now uh they ultimately the when we say zones that's the load serving entity ultimately the residential customer that goes down to the residential level, the actual load serving entities who are paying the LMP price, they will pass that through to the customers and they'd also include what other rates that they are included in that utility. PGM doesn't handle that part of it. We're just doing it to the, the load serving entity level at that point. 
and the uh, the zonal prices are calculated for that. Now, if it's constrained on the system, the LMPs will split, and there'll be different prices in different areas. But that's really a high level of how it's done. Thanks, Tim. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, so now we move on to the next question, which is uh, question number four, and it relates to the Spanish market. So, George, uh, this question relates to I think uh, the participant wanted to ask that renewables are being integrated in all the markets, but is there any value that the Spanish market gave gives on or is considering to give on the firm capacity of such technologies? Hey, uh, thank you. Well, uh, I can answer this question very fast, saying, OK, it's under debate. <laughs> but let me explain a little bit more uh, the, this question. Uh, we said before that uh, the problem is uh, how to integrate this huge amount of renewables and at the same time to keep the conventional generation uh, connected to the system. So the idea of the capacity is more an idea of helping the conventional generation rather than the renewables. But saying it this way uh, is keeping half of the problem. If you permit me very quickly to project a slide I have projected before, this is, are you seeing yes. my screen? No, okay. not yet. If we are seeing that half of the capacity yeah. is solar and wind, and you put zero firm capacity to this uh, generation, the rest, which also includes uh, hydro, perhaps gives a lot of market power to this other generation to set very, very high capacity prices. And on the other hand, the same people that are having solar and wind are arguing, OK, wait, wait, wait. Perhaps a solar, a single solar plant or a single wind fire plant cannot provide any capacity, film capacity, but a lot of them, we are nowadays sharing all the risk of balancing. They are not excluding from the balancing. So in the short term, we are providing the capacity, or if not, uh, at least we permit me to make contracts with others and, and try to. So it's not a very easy answer to that. And for that reason has not been decided up to now. If you ask me, but this is a personal opinion, not necessarily representing Spain, uh, I think uh, this type of generation should not receive any film capacity payment certificates or simple. But uh, of course, there are arguments against that. And they say, no, no, you have to give me something because I'm providing some certainty. Uh, my Pure view, point of view is a little bit pragmatic. If we are introducing capacity payments for, uh, say, avoiding the generation, conventional generation to go out of the system because I need it for operational reasons, okay, not, say, uh, should receive zero credit or something similar. But it's under debate. Uh, and this is regarding the, the market integration. The technical integration is a totally different issue that is managed by the system operator. But uh, the debate is not, not very easy. And that's the reason it's taking a lot of time and all across Europe. I can say that in the last three or four years, I have been hearing arguments in one direction or the other direction about how to, to manage that. Uh, no clue what will be the final decision. That means it's an unsolved problem for the moment. So well, that's the reason I say that my guess is that in the next years will be patches. For me, excluding the solar and wind from capacity, film capacity, saying zero film capacity, it's a patch because something they are doing. But okay, uh, very probably in the next year we will see several of these ad hoc con conclusions uh, until a final agreement is reached. But the, the short the answer, unfortunately, is under debate and no, say no, no, I cannot say no consensus. They say there is no agreement between the different portions because all of them have some portion of the truth. It's just a, just an add on. I think everybody is, will be interested on the, this follow up question to you, George, is what are the considerations that, let's say, the renewable developers 
uh, are looking at integrating well, batteries. Uh, yes. Yeah. Renewables developers are preparing for this future system with capacity. And so gradually, but very incipient, they are starting installing batteries. The problem is when you enter in the economy for the batteries, uh, they are still very expensive. They are still very expensive. So not necessary uh, the say, financial equations close, say, uh, clearly. So one of the options that is probably what have is gaining adepts all across Europe is, OK, we will give you some film capacity, let's say certificate or uh, uh, assigned or whatever name you want to put it, but you need to have batteries. Uh, so these batteries will help to balance the equation, the financial equation of the developer. And uh, at the same time, uh, the system operator uh, became a little bit more happy because they, they have a lot of problems for operating the system nowadays. Probably uh, renewals with batteries will receive film capacity, uh, occasions to allocate it to them. If we're talking back in, in Pakistani environment, it means film capacity certificates, but probably will have another name in Europe, uh, but uh, only if they have batteries only if they have battery. And this will permit the battery market to grow as it happens with renewables. That means uh, nowadays, as I say, they're very expensive, but if they are receive some money for providing capacity, and <laughs> this may be the solution. Then it's a lot of details, a lot of details about that, especially how much film capacity you give a, uh, say a wind and uh, generation with batteries, depending on the battery size, the battery duration, the, number, the amount of megawatt hour, etc. So there is a lot of details that are being discussed, and probably we'll see. A, I cannot say a final solution, but a partial solution in less than one year from now, because the, all these issues are being debated a lot in Europe nowadays. In Spain, but in the whole Europe. Right. Thank you. Thank you, George, uh, for for your response. So now we move towards uh, South America and uh, to, to our friend uh, Ricardo. Ricardo, this question actually was, uh, you know, one of the participants asked about transparency. Uh, Tim, who, uh, who is our presenter from PGM, he also in his presentation made a point that the rules should be very simple, right, rather than getting an optimal kind of a rule which is very difficult to understand. So this is kind of a question that I think uh, the participant picked from that discussion. And he has asked that he or she has asked that the Brazilian electricity market does uh, it not violate the principle of transparency. As you said that the price formulation is done through software complicated you know, algorithms through several permutations. What is the feedback from the market participants in this regard? Uh, nice Ricardo? question. Uh Nice question. Um, this is an, a very nice question. Uh, well, basically, um, let me see how I can answer that. Um, basically, the agents have access to this software and they can do their own forecasts. But I would say that mainly in Brazil for I like this approach, personally speaking. I like a tool that that provides the price forecast because if I have the tool, I can forecast prices and I can see if I change a parameter, what is the impact on prices and so on. So I personally like that. The problem is, uh, uh, Tim said many things that I like it. For example, he said, uh, sometimes the best a uh, solution in, a, in the theory is not the best in the practice. So maybe this solution is amazing in theory. The, like in practice here in Brazil, uh, the problem is that uh, the softwares uh, used are of, uh, uh, the ones officially used are developed by the government. Uh, so uh, they they that we we do also have some criticisms and some some critics about how it's it evolution in time, how the parameters are changing and so on. So I would say that our agents in Brazil uh, would are not so satisfied with what we have today as official ones. 
but I wouldn't say that they are unsatisfied in terms of the solution we decided. Did I re re answer the question? Um, this is not a trivial question, but I think this is this is it. OK, OK, uh, got it. So, you know, you've answered it. I think in PJM so, is the same, right? You you run a software there, a short term software, and you get a price, right? Right, team. So. So that's correct. So at the end of the day, uh, the problem is not the software, it's how you implement it, right? So, and which software you have and, and what is the transparency to the agent? How is the software, uh, if the software is good enough, if the software models the reality of the system operation, if the parameters are adherent to the system operating operation reality, uh, that that is the key, right? If this is solved. Right, right. So, Ricardo, uh, George has, a, it seems like George has a question for you. Yes, George. Okay. Yeah, hello. Well, it was not at the, at the question. It was a simple comment about what Ricardo was saying that I fully agree with him that the models uh, are the, probably the better solution. But uh, the problem with these models is they are complex. And when there's a complex model, uh, depending on the developer, it, it may be a barrier or not. For, for the banks, for example, explaining complex models. It's extremely difficult, and uh, when you have a project finance or things like that, they like they want to see very very simple questions. But uh, of course, the, for complex problems, the the models are complex. That's that's, that's the only solution. But uh, yeah, I, I understand the people, especially the developers, for having something that is very easy, an Excel sheet and and the answer. Uh, but this is not the case when the for example, in, this, in Europe, I mentioned this Euphemia algorithm, which is a very complex algorithm, very, very complex algorithm. And it took years until they agreed that everybody will use it. OK. OK, thank you, George. Uh, so Ricardo, thanks for your answer. And let's move on to the last question of the session, uh, which is how the total volume contracted in an auction is distributed among different type of technologies. So uh, as you said that technology neutral auctions are being done. So how this is being done based on the planning that a central entity does? Can you? Perfect. Uh, this is a very good question. In fact, uh, it's an amazing question. But before I answer this one, I want just to sum up the comments of George, uh, Jorge and Tim. And in my mind, I agree with both. Like uh, the solution should be simple. And, and one preoccupation that I have is the exactly point that Jorge said is that we are moving to uh, a way that PJM is a much more mature system that, than our free market. So they have many financial projects to, to, to help the electrical system to settle the, the, the negotiations, right? Well, our free make market is maturing. And one of my key preoccupations is that is that we have a short-term model with unit commitment, mixed integer linear programming problem. What is the load marginal cost is the dual variable associated to the load balance constraint, right? So, so I, I am preoccupied, and this is an issue, right? I'm preoccupied about the complexity of the price formation uh, in order to evolve to financial products and take uh, banking people inside the electrical system. I, I totally agree on the concern. And this is, a, I think it's a thing that keeps in my mind, okay? May I move to the last part? I would also yes, like, if we have time, I would like to hear what Tim has to say about it because he has much more experience on that than us. Sure, I can jump in real quick before we get to the last question. Yeah, and when I talk about complexity, it's not just in the, the LMP formation. Um, the, the basic model of LMP formation and that model is not very, I'm not going to say it's not complicated, but it's basic. A lot of people use the same type of model. As you mentioned, some of these add-ons, you know, if we start looking at multi-day commitments and stuff like that, it starts to really get complicated. And PGM, we are looking into that. Like I said, this is Tim's opinion. And I said on some of my solutions there where, you know, sometimes getting too complicated is 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 not necessarily the right thing to do. But it's not just the, the formation of the actual um, LMP simulation and whatnot, it's the add-ons. What other inputs are you adding on there? What other factors are you allowed? What other type of bid behaviors? Are you including 
13 price type offers of different levels or are you requiring just a simple amount amount of offers that are allowed because now when you start solving a like a model like a combined cycle model when there's 50,000 or 50 different configurations do you simplify that or do you, you keep it allow to get the perfect solution like that's a perfect example of combined cycle units where i really think we just narrow it down and try to keep it simple with that area so that's when you can really start extending in different areas um thanks for the comments i really appreciate it well so let's jump to this uh, question number six how is the total volume contracted in the auction and is spread out the different types of technology to answer this question, I need to show more details, so uh, I will share my screen here. Uh, I hope you can see now. So basically, what's happened is the following. As I said, in 2007, we have we had in the past some dedicated auctions for renewables. Now we don't have it. Now we have uh, uh, one auction, right? But what does our government do? They look at the the discos provide first their energy. Uh, the, the energy they need to buy in the auction. So the government don't tell anybody, receive the order orders of the renewables. So it has the demand, uh, sorry, it, it receives the orders of the discos. So it has the amount of the demand that must be hired in the auction, right? Then having that, what the model does, uh, what our government does, they, they all the all the resources will compete in the same auction. They will compete in the same auction, right? However, what the the government does is the following: he separates an amount for each product, and it doesn't tell anybody. So in the market, people don't know beforehand the amount of each product that will be higher in the auction. In spite, uh, in but they compete for the same discos, right? Um, and then uh, the government doesn't tell the share for each project, product and doesn't also share the total amount of demand. He doesn't tell these issues, okay? These details. Now we need a concept very clear here to move on. We have two types of contract. One is the quantity. It's a standard take or pay energy contract paid by a fixed contracted energy. And we have a availability contract. The availability is an energy option contract where you rent a thermal plant, you pay a fixed revenue, and you reimburse the variable operating costs when the thermal plant operates. So basically, the operates have availability contracts. You rent them, and when they dispatch, you pay their operating costs. And you have the content quantity contracts. Of course, it's intuitive to see that hydro plants, renewables are in the quantitative contracts, right? And then we, well, I'm not going to dive into the details how we settle the prices of the auctions, but basically they're fixed, operating, uh, system charges, and so on. But what is nice to see is that here, what happened is the following. Uh, we, the government knows the, 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 the demand for each product. So we have the quantity project of small hydros. We have an amount to be hired as... Uh, biomass in availability product, coal. We have a quantity product of wind. We have a quantity product of solar. So basically, the government knows these demands, designs these products, and go to the auction and let them compete. I hope I have answered the question, but that's mainly it. Okay. So the government beforehand set separate the products, quantities of hydros, wind, solar, availability of biomass. And then the, it goes to the auction to buy the energy. Well, thank you so much, Ricardo, uh, for comprehensively answering the, the all two questions. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, that we reached to the end of the, our session today. It, is, it has been about three and a half hours now. So a pretty long session with a very short break. Well, by the way, we have uh, the scores from the quiz as well. So the, the average score is 72%, which is quite good. So it means people were, not, were quite alert and they were not sleeping. <laughs> they didn't go away. So well done. Uh, I would like to especially thank uh, all four presenters uh, for helping Apex in advancing its mission of, uh, you know, spreading the knowledge uh, to its member countries and participants and all the participants for staying that long with us. So stay tuned for the next session, which will be next month. Uh, and we will send out the invite and the brochures for it. Thank you, everybody, and have a good day. Have a good night.
Take care. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. It was a pleasure. Shukriya. See you.